seminar and uh, also it's an opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about you. Uh, how, what was your journey like all the way to Stanford now as I guess you were the department chair, you became a department chair last year. As I said, uh, I, as I said to many of my fellow chairs, congratulations and condolences both <laughs> at the same time for this uh, distinction. So can you tell us a little bit, Alan, uh, how is that? I think I know you did civil engineering and how, how is that you ended up from civil engineer in Germany to uh, doing a brain research and heart research <laughs> in Stanford? Yeah, that's quite a journey, I agree. So I uh, did my degree in Hanover in Germany and then um, I did, in Germany, you have this second thesis, which is called habilitation. And then at that point, um, it was really hard for young people in Germany um, to get a faculty position because there was not this kind of hierarchy that we have in the US where you start as assistant professor and associate at full. So you have to get a full professor position right away in Germany. And of course, when you're young, it's very difficult. And so then I just looked around and I applied and actually got the position at Stanford. It was initially just really random luck. It wasn't that I targeted that really. And so um, I ended up here. And then when you asked about the heart and the brain, um, there was kind of a natural that evolved when I came here because we have a medical school here on campus. And so a lot of students are interested in, in any medical kind of research and they came and found me more than me finding them. So that was quite exciting. So, so you, uh, I know your background is a computational mechanics. So when you, uh, when you became a faculty, the, the biomechanics research started by uh, as a push from the medical side, the medical uh, uh, school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had students that were looking for an advisor in, in engineering, then they found me. And the first student was actually someone working on the heart. Uh, and that was quite exciting. And so the heart is something really core to mechanics, right? Because it has pumping. So actually the function of the heart is really, really mechanics. And then it soon became a multi-field problem because that's this electrical field that excites the heart. And then that turns into the contraction of the heart. And then it soon became a multi-scale problem because you can zoom into the heart and look at individual heart fibers, what they do. And so it was actually all the nice things that you can do in modeling in one, one actually one thing, the heart. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I think I, I, I personally uh, started uh, getting interested in biophysics much later in my career. But one thing I found, which is I'm sure you discovered very early on, is it's a very target rich environment. There are lots and lots of problems to do in the area of biology. Right. Yeah, that's true. And actually, especially it's really fun to talk about um, when you talk about some bio problems. So before I worked on concrete, and I'm not saying that's boring, but you tell someone in your family I'm working on concrete and then they think you really mix the concrete, right? Because yeah. that's their relation. And when you say we work on the heart, then they would immediately say, oh, I have this heartburn and heart pain. So what does that do? And how does it, so then actually people get very engaged. And that, I think that's actually a lot of fun, yeah. Oh yeah, you can uh, see from the example that I, my, my mom and dad are laymen, are lay people. And I, when I mentioned your seminar, they immediately wanted to give me a list of questions to ask. <laughs> I had to try to <laughs> well, you have to be a little bit careful though, right? Because at the end of the day, you're not really a doctor. So yeah, sure. I'm going to talk about that a little bit today too, being careful of what you can do and what you shouldn't be doing and where you should actually be careful with your statements. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I think once you, uh, uh, you have more or less stuck with the biomechanics uh, throughout your career, right? Uh, you have not, you're not doing anything more traditional civil engineering anymore. No, so now I'm in mechanical, so it's mainly mechanical engineering. I mean, once in a while, there's a problem that pops up that's more mechanical engineering. So the overarching theme, and I think it's pretty much answering your question, is um, it's nonlinear finite elements. It's multi-field, it's multi-physics, so any kind of problem. So at some point in all this process, we looked at um, folding of the Earth crust. And interestingly, that's very similar to, to brain folding, right? So I've worked actually with people in geophysics about that. So there was... Uh, it's the same equation. I guess you had John Hutchinson here as well. So we worked actually with John on that. Um, and he also came from just this geophysics folding to actually brain folding. And interestingly, he was one of the first in 1975 to publish on brain folding. So this that's a really interesting connection. Absolutely. Yeah, the one thing, uh, Ellen, uh, that I've uh, heard from many people who work in the bio area is that when they do computational or modeling work. So this pertains especially to mechanics people like us. They uh, tend to be somewhat skeptical about uh, 
modeling in general, uh, definitely mechanics and so forth. Uh, they're very empirical. The, the medical science has been traditionally very, you know, empirical based. Uh, and, but you have had a lot of success. Uh, you, you, I, I read about your initiative, the, uh, the, the, heart, the heart initiative. And uh, it's mentioned that there are like 400, 400 entities participating across the countries. I mean, that should that seems to be completely contradict this notion that <laughs> the medical establishment uh, is not you know that much engaged in modeling people and so forth. What is many your experience like? I mean, you seem to indicate with the medical school in Stanford, there's a lot of uh, back and forth between uh, engineering and uh, uh, the medical school. Um, yeah, I mean, in that sense, we are very blessed because the medical school is right there, so we don't have a river run between the medical side <laughs> and the kind of the university side like you have uh, in Boston. But um, also I think it, what it takes is really a lot of talking and because we are so close together, there's a lot of real interaction. And then what you just mentioned is this Living Heart project that of course also was just in a way a very lucky situation that we were all of a sudden in. Um, and that's this, this heart project um, that it was actually uh, initiated in a collaboration with Abacus, with the Finite Element Company. And so they actually just look for something showcasey to convince the bio, the biomedical folks. So for instance, it's not just doctors, it's also the device design companies, right? So it's a huge market and they need to design tools and they can, they actually understand stress analysis, right? right. So, and they were looking for something to help them with that for the heart. And so that was a good target into it and then through all of that you build confidence and then now all of a sudden it's I think it's accepted that you can actually simulate the heart where like I think 10 15 years ago people would say no way you can actually make informed predictions here right and there uh, the now uh, what about uh, using the results of modeling in actual practice say for example in surgery there that has also happened there uh, uh, yeah I, I think I think people do that a lot I don't know you probably no, my colleague at Stanford, Alison Marston, she also works on the heart and she looks more at the fluid flow. So we actually collaborate and she actually has a joint appointment in uh, pediatrics. So she works very, very closely with heart surgeons and they come with problems. So for instance, um, there's a person who has a heart defect, a birth defect. And then the idea is to, can we simulate that? Can we understand that? Um, the, the problem is you have to be a little careful, of course, because these simulations, as we all know, take time. So it's nothing that at this point you can do in real time. And typically when people are very interested to know is when they're themselves affected or they have little children that have birth defects, right? So there's a lot of interest from, from this community. Um, and then I think the problem is, okay, you can't really deliver a, a really full blown solution within a day or so. But I think we're getting closer to, to doing personalized simulations on that end. Well, that is, this is very important. I, I think the more translation applications mechanics seeks, that's really good. Uh, I think traditionally, maybe in the back in the 60s, uh, mechanics was a little bit more ivory tower kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and I think now the fact that we are branching out into this translational impact is really good for, I guess, the community. Right? Uh, so, Ellen, uh, how did you end up in this topic, the coronavirus? <laughs> I guess that's, that's, a, that's a dumb question. Everybody knows about coronavirus, but how did you decide to get motivated to study this one? Yeah, so I guess everybody probably looked at it at some point. Um, there was all this, I, I think I took issue with the fact that people were saying models don't work. And you probably remember <laughs> that early on, everybody tried to predict, and I'm going to show some curves. I mean, you see that it's actually mind blowing that there is. I don't know, 10 different models give really vastly different results, not by an order of magnitude, but two or three. Um, and some models don't even fit the current, like today's data, right? And so then these are models that people use to make like their forward predictions weeks and weeks into the future. And I think we just took issue because we said, okay, now the models are all over the news. And I think everybody saw these models and like when press briefings, people held up their signs and this is the model and this is what's gonna happen. And so I think everybody was excited and we thought that's really an opportunity for modeling. But then we also felt that somehow at some point it was just mal represented, right? People were saying, oh, this doesn't work. We don't need models, what is it good for? And so we thought we would look at it ourselves. <laughs> and we found a lot of things, I'm gonna show this today. Um, and it's when you really modeling person like all of us are, um, there are things that you find that you immediately see, because we are familiar with modeling, that are typical to nonlinear equations, right? So there is 
very nonlinear dynamics in this disease. And there are things that, I mean, are very chaotic or very um, unstable. So if you perturb the system just a little bit, I mean, you end up blowing somewhere, which we all understand. But I think a lot of people in the general public don't understand that. And then they don't understand why the models don't work. So uh, out of curiosity, no, that's very interesting, uh, Alan, but out of curiosity, the epidemiologists, the people who study epidemics, uh, do they typically have mathematical background? Like, or like for example, you do, uh, you're a competition mechanics person. Do the professional epidemiologist people have uh, the kind of training that the, uh, mechanics people have? And that's an interesting question. So there's this whole field of mathematical epidemiology and so these are people that in a way do applied mathematics and especially around the 70s, um, there was a real popular field where people used mathematics to understand. So give you an example, for instance, um, the measles, you probably remember that there was this huge yeah. vaccination campaign, right? Yeah. And so these people used mathematical epidemiology to understand how many people you need to vaccinate. And that's a question that's very um, current today, right? We, we, if we have a vaccine, how much do we need to use it? Who do we vaccinate first? And so actually you can with that rad eradicate a disease. Um, and that, that was the goal back then. So then it was very popular in, in the seventies. And so what these people do is really essentially what we do. We talked with Jigang before you came on. So it's ordinary differential equations usually. So they use a couple system of equations to understand the dynamics of a disease. And then they do just nonlinear analysis. And most of it back then was analytical solutions, right? And okay. now we have the, the, the power that we can do it numerically. So like stability and bifurcation analysis. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. These kind of things really. I mean, you want to look at the peak, for instance, right? When the curve peaks um, uh, or an inflection points. I'll show a couple of things today where you're interested in the inflection point and the curve is rising. You're interested in, okay, have we reached the inflection where we can actually feel that we see some results of some political action, right? And I, I, I'm guessing when you outline your your thoughts on this topic in the beginning, uh, to, I'm assuming you have, you're working with some students on this one, right? This project, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. How were they very excited about this? Yeah, I think so. I was actually lucky. Um, so there are a couple of students in our group who were interested and then I was also very lucky that uh, I had one postdoc visiting from Germany, uh, Kevin. So he just actually, uh, interestingly, he wanted to work on the heart. So it's funny that you brought that up. So he came here um, in March and actually I have never met him and we have seven papers <laughs> together on this. So he is um, just a few miles away from here. So that was just like a week after our campus had completely shut down and we have not yet reopened. And so I haven't really physically seen him. We just talk on Zoom. And then uh, another postdoc, Matthias is from Belgium. And so it's interesting because people come from different locations. So one of the people is Kevin from Germany, then Matthias from Belgium. And I had a former student, Francisco, who was in Chile, who looks at the disease dynamics in Chile and then worked with Alain Gorelli, who's in the UK. Right. So every of one of these countries has their own dynamics and people are interested in just that. So that makes it also actually very interesting to talk to people about. Yeah, the, the, the dynamics in each country is different. I think in large part, I suspect, which you, are, you know, of course, very well, is because of the political environment. It's uh, it is fascinating to me to see how the same pandemic is being viewed by a diff different political lens in every single country. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if you 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 work at, at all, gets involved in that matter at all uh, on the yeah, so, um, and that actually is very interesting because if you think about this, the measles was different, right? The measles would just evolve. It would run through the country. There was very little, say, 100 years ago or the flu. There was very little interaction. And so that's why everything looked somewhat similar in every place, right? And now there's a lot of, like you said, governments actually determining, flattening this curve, pressing down the number of infections. And you can see in the behavior of the population really how effective these means are that the government is implementing. So we've looked at this a lot. And then there's interestingly really nonlinear numbers or characteristics that define exactly what you can see, what you will see probably a week or two out. Um, and so those numbers are different for each country and they're an indicator of how well the politics are, how tight they are. And I'm showing, I'll show some of that as well. It's a good point. And that's why it's so interesting because every, it's in a way it's something that's currently evolving 
and you're doing something and you can see the response of your model, right? I mean, it's not only that you model something, but you can predict something. And then two weeks from now, you look at this and say, did we actually predict the right thing? Well, that's so interesting, kind of uh, Elena, but I, I was also, what I was really asking is that I, because you have such an international team working on this project, you have people from Belgium, Germany, and so mm -hmm. forth. I'm curious whether, uh, uh, what perspective, political perspective they bring from their own home countries about this, uh, this pandemic. But I guess scientists are probably the same everywhere. Scientists will... Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, people have different, for instance, what's very controversial and, and um, that, of course, everybody discusses a lot is this, how much do you constrain movement of people, right? And the most important one of that is like really on top motion. So the very global thing is closing airports. Um, and so people can't travel anymore. And I think that affects all of us because especially our communities traveling a lot, right? We're all international to some country. We're always traveling, we enjoy traveling and now we can't travel anymore. So that's actually a, a really critical impact. But I mean, even more so on a very local level, you can implement that people can't leave the house um, and that's different in every country. And uh, not only is it different, but also has different effects, right? So you can study that and discuss that with your group. So it's really interesting. So I, on a, since I know we've been talking about health a lot, but uh, let me move to something more positive on health. Uh, <laughs> I think we have seen in your biography, we read it, uh, you were one of the finalists in the uh, Kona Ironman uh, competition. Uh, how did you get involved in, uh, can you, maybe since some people may not know what that is, can you tell us a little bit about that and how did you get involved in that, uh, that sort of stuff? So yeah, no, that's interesting. So I, I mean, when you live in California, the weather is always nice, uh, except for maybe a month in the year. So a lot of people actually do go outside and to compensate work and get some work-life balance. And so um, we did, so what it entails is swimming, um, biking and running. So you swim for the full Ironman, you swim at 3.8 kilometers, and then you bike 160 kilometers. And then at the end of this, you run a marathon. And that takes about, I mean, for me, a little longer probably than for the average uh, good athlete with like 11 and a half, 12 hours. Um, and then uh, obviously you don't train this full distance always beforehand, but you do it once and that's when you race it. Uh, Eleven hours is very good. There are two, uh, two or three young uh, people on the screen. Let, let, let them introduce themselves. Of course, of course. Yeah. Li Hua, can you introduce yourself? Why are you are muted. You are muted. You're muted, Li Hua. And Yu Hang, you're next. Unmute yourself. Okay. Hey, hello, everybody. Hello, Alan. Yeah, this is Li Huajing. I'm from uh, UCLA. Yeah, actually, uh, I spent two years at Stanford, and uh, thanks, Alan, for giving me the opportunity to attend your group meeting. Yeah, I remember you. <laughs> good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah. Hey, Yu Hang. Hey, Alan. This is Yu Hang. I'm from uh, Georgia Tech, and uh, we work on mechanics of soft materials, and uh, a lot of your work are, are very uh, inspiring to us. And uh, um, especially your spirit from uh, moving from one uh, uh, interesting uh, topic to another and becoming expert in every uh, topic <laughs> are very inspiring to uh, young faculties. Hi, Yuan. Hey. See you. Good to see you. Hey, pretty back to you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I was, I was just saying that, uh, Ellen was saying that she it took her only 11 hours to finish the Ironman competition. I think it'll take me a few weeks to finish it. So <laughs> it's just kind of pretty uh, a nice record. Uh, yeah, I guess the uh, the most intimidating thing you could do is when you have your group, group meeting while jogging with your students. Uh, and uh, I'm <laughs> not anybody can keep up. Uh, so, uh, so Alan, how many uh, uh, PhD students have you advised so far? Uh, um, PhD students on your 15, 20. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, uh, that's and I mean, I also should say I, I was very blessed because many of them, like Jigang, many of them actually stay somehow in academia. So you keep seeing them again, which makes it really, really interesting. Um, unfortunately, this summer, of course, we don't really get to see each other in person because there's no conference. But I think that the most interesting thing is to see people again over and over. So, I mean, that, that I find really inspiring and see how they, what they do and what they, how they diverge from what we've done before together. 
yeah, no, I, I think that's that's probably the most exciting aspect of, of this job overall is to yeah, work with I, young people. I agree. I think I, when when your students decide to stay in academia, that's that is a very enjoyable thing. Uh, Yuha, Liuha, Jimmy, uh, uh, I'm sorry I didn't see you before, but uh, you have any questions for Alan? Sure, Alan, uh, good to see you again. Pradeep, good to see you too. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this is wonderful. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is this is uh, I it is great. I'm lo really looking forward to Alan's talk. Hi Jimmy, yeah. good to see you. Hi. Yeah. So Zigan, so, what so time do we spend? You're changing your field. You're not doing brain simulation anymore. <laughs> yeah, actually <laughs> interesting. So okay, so so here's the, the real story, and that's the true story. So we started doing this. Um, the brain, as you probably know, has this network of connections, right? And so information is passed on the brain through um, these wires, the cells, from actually where the, the processing happens at, is at the end. So the, everything else in between is just the connections. And so we had this model that we used for the brain where you solve ordinary differential equations at the nodes, and then you, the nodes talk to each other through the connections. And then actually when this pandemic hit, um, we looked at these maps when people were saying, okay, so here's a, a plane, an airplane map, and here's the street map. And there's actually findings that the disease travels along highways, for instance, or it travels uh, along very frequently used paths. So we thought this is the same. So we use the same model, and that's not kidding. We use exactly the same code that we use for the brain information for this network. And of course, the thing that's different is what happens at the individual nodes. So these ordinary different vibrations are different, but the solution, the, the big global um, network is actually the same. And because we had used it a lot for the brain over the last three or four years, this was actually good head start and good advantage that we could just manipulate it, right? And it's much easier because for the models we use now, we have a lot less nodes. So it's actually quite interesting. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning, good morning Ellen. Hi. Hey, yes. Remember I see you a couple of times at the NIH review panel? Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you. I mean, interested to look for your talk, you know. So you do a lot of modeling. Now you're modeling the COVID-19, huh? That's great. Yeah, yeah. so it, it just came up. What's the trigger? Something. Why you started doing um, the COVID-19? Uh, yeah, I think we just got interested in understanding it better. I guess like everybody is thinking, can we understand this? It was more driven out of curiosity. And then when you get into it, you realize actually you can do the same thing that you see on TV when people show these curves. Because I mean, as we would see, um, you will all, I, I'm sure you all in an hour say, oh, I could do this in a day <laughs> because you're all smart people. And if you look at the equation, it's very easy to do. Um, and it's very interesting because it relates to data that you can download from the web. There's a lot of data, right? We all see the data or part of it. And it's all well archived and well documented. So that's actually a huge opportunity to use this. And I think for us as a community, there's also in a way a charge to do this, right? Because we know nonlinear differential equations. We know how instabilities work. We know that a small perturbation on something can have a huge effect in a nonlinear problem. And so I think um, for us, it's, that's even more than just an opportunity. It's a responsibility to actually use what we know and educate ourselves or people about it. Because a lot of people actually use these things wrong and make wrong predictions, right? And that can have huge effect, as we've seen. <laughs> Alan, you are the one who actually wrote overview, EML webinar overview way ahead of your presentation. <laughs> have you received a proof already? Uh, not yet, no. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I did write this. It's a huge mistake because in this disease, um, things happen so quickly so when you write when you write uh, usually a paper what happens is by the time you get it i mean in this case it went very smooth right but sometimes when you have a long review by the time you get it back and then people say well it's already so outdated we already know that this hasn't happened so what's really different to what we usually do is that you work with data that are generated that are non-linear and you, you really don't know mm. and and so that makes it actually even more exciting so i'm going to show some things in in the presentation that are from the early outbreak of the disease, where we now look at this and say, well, why did you even do this, right? So I think it's a, this aspect of things developing as you do it, that's also very exciting and very different from what we usually do. So, yeah, I'm so Alan, uh, look at uh, the overview. I think it will come out next week. That's our usual appearance a week. 
Great. Yeah, thank you. I mean, this is really exciting to actually do this um, on such an audience. I've watched some of them just like in, in retrospect on because it's all archived. It's also nice in a way to always have it all on that website. So it's a really nice format, I must say. You're leading the field to bring everybody together with this. This is great. Yeah. yeah. I, I honestly think uh, yeah. it's a Salim from uh, Penn State. Nice to see you on, uh, on the webinar. And I know that you have been working a lot on the morphogenesis of tissues and organs. Uh, I guess that the similarities between uh, your modeling of the morphogenesis and uh, COVID-19 uh, is, is, yeah. is because of the collective behaviors of the species, of the players? Um, I think yeah, there's people who actually model this with agent-based models. That's not mm -hmm. exactly what we do, but um, the models are somewhat similar in that you have a global diffusion equation, so that's kind of a partial differential equation, and then locally you have ordinary differential equations that describe the dynamics and so in growth, um, in a way, you also have something that's really growing. Um, and so in that sense, the local equations are somewhat similar of something that's increasing. In this case, of course, as we all know, the increase is hugely nonlinear and exponential. Um, but I think that if you understand just nonlinear ordinary differential equations, I think you'll, you have a huge advantage to understanding this. Yeah. And there's a lot of things, of, obviously, that when you do modeling, you can use. You will see during the talk that you can all do this, I'm sure. It's really not extremely difficult. Sure. What is difficult is, is finding the right problem, right? Finding a problem that you can um, really confidently answer. So people would ask, what will the disease look like in two years or in three months? And I think no, no, nobody can predict that. It's like the weather, right? So you have to be confident what you can ask and answer and what your window is in which you can make informed predictions because it's not infinite, obviously, because of the high nonlinearity. I, I guess I, I'm trying to ask uh, yeah. whether the community. Uh, we, we, we have to. Uh, yes. start. Okay, okay. I can ask later. later. Yeah, we we'll do it later. Alan, can we ask you to uh, project your your slides? Yes, let me do that. And uh, Pradeep, you take it over. Absolutely. Uh, uh, well, welcome everyone to the. Uh, I think it is the 16th uh, seminar in the uh, Extreme Mechanics uh, Letters uh, webinar series. I think it's fair to say that even though the first EML webinar appeared just about only four months ago, it has already become a very important part of the lives of many mechanicians around the world. And uh, it shows up in a number of people who are attending the, uh, today's talk. So with that, uh, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ellen Kuhl uh, from Stanford University as our speaker today. Uh, as you can see from uh, the screen, the, the topic, uh, Ellen will discuss something that has uh, had an almost a visceral impact on uh, most of us, right? Uh, so but before Ellen starts her talk, let me say a few words about her background. Uh, Ellen received uh, both her bachelor's and master's from the Lebanese University of Hanover. Uh, she majored in uh, uh, civil engineering. Uh, and then for her PhD, she went to the University of Stuttgart. Uh, where I think, I believe uh, uh, she started specializing in computational mechanics uh, and she graduated with her uh, PhD in the year 2000. This is, and it's very common for many German scientists. Uh, Ellen spent a few years completing her habilitation and this she finished at TU Kaiserlautern. Uh, and uh, maybe in a, after spending a couple of years in Germany, she joined the Stanford University in 2006 as an assistant professor. Uh, after that, she has uh, rapidly risen through the ranks and became a full professor. And in particular, last year, Ellen became the Robert Bosch chair of the department. Now, uh, being the department chair was not Ellen's first leadership role. She has been very active in the community. I think as many of you know, uh, she's, for example, the current chair of the US National Committee on Biomechanics, a member elect of the World Council of Biomechanics and, and many other uh, initiatives. What I really found fascinating was a, a rather special initiative she launched a, a while back, the so-called Living Hearts Project. So now this involves uh, 400 participants across 24 countries that use high fidelity simulations. This is in conjunction with a commercial company that sort of attempts to revolutionize cardiovascular science. For example, B-scope uh, 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 tailored uh, 
uh, heart valves. Uh, so it's a very nice example of how mechanics uh, can emerge in a translational application. So Alan has also many awards and honors. Uh, for, uh, for example, she's an ASME fellow. She received the Humhold uh, Research Award, the NSF Career Award. She serves on many editorial boards uh, of and including uh, the Journal of the Mechanics and Physics of Solids. So uh, I think many of you joined a bit early, so you already know this, um, it, like it's a it's common practice for email webinars. Some of us conducted uh, an informal interview of Ellen right before this. You can watch the recording and learn more about her. Uh, what uh, You will learn many interesting things. One of them, for example, a personal detail, Ellen is quite the athlete. Uh, she was a finalist in the Kona Ironman uh, uh, Championship. Those of you who don't know what that means, uh, it's basically a triathlon that lasts half a day, involves a two and a half mile swim, 112 mile bike ride, and then if you are not tired enough, you can then run a marathon for about 26 miles after that. So with that, Ellen, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Pradeep. Um, first of all, thanks to Tang and Zigang for inviting me and making this work and organizing everything around it. I'm very excited uh, to be here. Um, I would like to share our work on modeling COVID-19. And um, as we just heard, it's something that touches all our lives. And we got involved in this actually out of sheer curiosity. So I'm very lucky and blessed to work with really um, exciting people who actually, um, we had very stimulating discussions throughout the past couple of months. Um, one of them is Matthias Pilling. So he's a, a postdoc in my lab and he's from Belgium. And then um, you also see a lot of simulations from Kevin Linker. He's a postdoc from Germany. And Francisco Zali Costabal is a previous student from Stanford. He is now a professor in Chile. And then we've been working with Proton Raman. I show you um, some of his contributions at the end. And I'm a, a very close collaborating on many aspects and on this as well with Alain Gorielli, who many of you know. Alain is in mathematics uh, at Oxford in the UK. So let me start with this. If you read this, this is from a paper that's called The Lessons of the Pandemic. And it was in 1919 and it was published in Science, so more than 100 years ago. And it actually relates exactly to how we feel when we are exposed to the pandemic today. So it came, we didn't really know where it came from initially, it just overran us. I mean, now in retrospect, six months into it, I think we have a much better understanding. But initially, nobody seemed to know what it was, where it came from. And actually, the last sentence is very current. So people are wondering, if there's going to be a second wave. So for those of you who joined from Europe, Europe is currently seeing uh, in many countries the beginning of a second wave and many other countries are afraid of that. So this is 100 years old, but it's as, as um, current as it can be actually these days. So this is something that you probably have seen many, many times now. So this is just to introduce kind of like what the timeline of the disease looks like. And this is to introduce how we model it. So on top, you see a timeline here with, um, with a couple of days. And here you can see what happens. So initially, um, people are just susceptible to the disease. And unlike many other infectious diseases, nobody really is immune to this. And that makes it actually pretty dangerous. Um, and then some people, very few people get exposed to it initially. So this stands for exposed. And then they infect other people. And it's only when it's orange that you can actually you sh show symptoms. And those are the symptoms that we know. You cough, you have uh, problems breathing, you have a temperature, you might become very, very sick. And that's what is called symptomatic. So that's what we see here in yellow. And so out of the symptomatic people, um, just a big fraction is lucky. They go through this disease, but then they recover. Some have to be hospitalized. And you may remember very early in the disease, there was this question, do we have enough hospital beds? So a lot of simulations centered around these really this most critical group here um, that are in the hospital. Do we have enough actually intensive care units to take care of these people? So this is, these are the different groups. And so the way um, that infectious disease modeling works is you have a population of um, one. So that's the total population. And that population, you just pass through these groups. And so initially there's one in this susceptible group and then depending on how infectious the disease is, you pass all the people here and then in the very, some scenario, everybody will have recovered and have gone through the disease. And this is what you see here in this graph. So essentially you're following people through these buckets 
and you have an ordinary differential equation for each of them. And as you can see on this slide, they're very, very simple. So typically people reduce the simulation to these four groups that you see here. So S is a susceptible group. So that's the initial group that people are in. Then the exposed group is people who are exposed to someone who was sick and infected them. This orange group is the dangerous group because these are the people that are infectious and can infect other people. And blue is good group. I mean, that's the recovered people again. And here, these four equations are the system of ordinary differential equations that describe this. And essentially, you have three time constant parameters or parameters that describe. Beta is a parameter how you pass from here to here. Alpha is um, the latent period, how you pass from here to here. And gamma is the infectious period, how to you or rate, how you pass from here to here. So the real um, nonlinearity comes into play through this first term. So you can see here, this is just passing with the parameter alpha and with the parameter gamma. But here, you have a feedback because the number of people that get infected depends on the group itself, but also on this orange population. That's why I said it's very, very important to know about this infectious population. And so there's a nonlinearity. So if there's a lot of infectious people, there will be more reinfected or infected through this. And then there's one very interesting number in addition to these three parameters that we've just learned. And that's called the basic reproduction number. And that's just basically the product, or if you want, this is the, the infectious period C divided by the contact period B. So that's what you see here. And that's important because it tells you how many people get infected by one person. So if you have one sick person in an otherwise healthy population, this number tells you how many people this person will infect. And I think you've all heard this number because it's reported a lot in the news. If this number is larger than one, you infect more people than recover. And so the curve goes up. And so the whole goal of political intervention is to bring this number R to something smaller than one. And if you do that for long enough, you can control the disease. So I think that's relatively simple for us to understand because we work with these kind of equations. And so then this is just showing what happens. So I'm showing you these four populations, just some parametric study. So this first one is varying the parameter A, which is the latent, um, the latent period. So that's how long a person has to be exposed before becoming infectious, really diseased. And you can see you can vary this period. It usually is on the order of two. And this is what happens when you increase it. So you don't really change much of the disease dynamic. Something happens faster. So this axis here is time. It happens faster or slower. But the number of people that will eventually go through the disease is the number that goes down here from 1 to somehow 0.2. Or the blue number here is the inverse, the recovered people. So here you have 80% at the end of the day uh, that have gone through the disease. We know that this didn't happen, fortunately. This is the same parameter study, but now for the infectious period C. And you can see, again, it just affects, affects the time, but not really the outcome, the, the end converged situation. Um, the same holds for the initial disease population, which is kind of the initial condition. This is how many people are initially in this E group, right? That starts with one. And this is something that we actually see. So if there's a, a large enough number in any country, the disease will just evolve. And then we just shift this time to the right if this number is larger, but it will just happen eventually. And that's just the nature of this nonlinear equation. And I think you all understand this because you've worked with these equations. So no matter how big this initial condition is, eventually this will happen. And this is a parameter that's a very important parameter. Now you can see, this is the first parameter that actually really affects the outcome, right? So this affects how the blue curve can be pushed down if the reproduction number is lower. So initially, if it's five, you have a lot of people going through the disease very, very fast. If the reproduction number is 1.5, you can slow this down and you can actually be much slower and you don't all see the disease. You might eventually end up with people who never get the disease without any intervention. So then you can play with all these parameters and these are some other playing. And it's just showing that this reproduction number is just incredibly important uh, on the slide. So whatever the reproduction number is, you will go through this disease faster or slower and you'll affect more or less people. So this was very interesting to understand at the beginning. And a lot of models actually failed uh, to describe this, right? So I'm showing you here our first attempt to simulate this and the colors are the same as I've introduced them. 
And this is for um, 30 Chinese provinces. And these data were published very early on. So this was about in, in March when we did this. And we tried to fit um, the model to these curves. And you can see it actually fits quite well. So it's fitting the orange, which is the infectious group, and the blue, which is the recovered group. You can see these small little numbers, which you probably can't read now, but these are the parameters of the model that we identified um, for all these um, provinces. And this is Matthias Pirling's work. So this is great. So this actually shows you can do it. There's one trick to it, um, and that's an extra parameter that you don't see that I haven't talked about. And that's the fraction of the population that gets infected. And that's this parameter uh, that you can see here, ether. And that parameter is critical um, because not all people went through the disease. So when this blue curve goes up, it's not one at all, right? I mean, we know that not 100% of the population went through the disease. So in a way, this is scaled into the people that actually were, um, for instance, when people are locked in their houses, this is scaled to the group of people that actually could eventually get the disease. This is showing you at the same time um, when we did this, we did it for the US and you can see the US really lacked in time. And I was saying this in the discussion earlier, this is when we did it, we had no idea where this would end up. So you can see this model fits very well, an exponential increase very early in the disease. And it actually helps you identify this parameter R, the um, reproduction number early in the disease. And I think we all agree this is beyond linear, so it's exponential. And you can identify this exponent if you want. Um, this is related to this R. So here are some of these parameters on top for China and, the, and then on the bottom for the US. Um, we fit uh, the disease parameters. So that's the parameters A, B, and C with what says days um, for China. And we use the same parameters for the US. And what's different is for every, um, every state and every province, we fit this R, the reproduction number. And what you see here is values that are huge. So if you follow the literature or the news, you probably hear R is on the order of one now that everything is under control. You also hear initially R was on the order of three. And what we believe happened is that people fit a, a model to this curve when they already saw a lot of flattening. And you can see the more you go to the beginning of the outbreak, the more, the higher this exponential is because then people, the population is just ran over by the disease. So this, what it's just saying is the disease is really, really dangerous. So if you were to do nothing, this parameter of five would mean that every one person would infect five other people. So it's not, you have to do something to contain them. And then you can nicely plot it out. So this is just solving this ordinary differential equation for all the states and then color coding what you can see. So the top is this number, the reproduction number. And in the US, it varied between three and seven. I think people were already um, informed how dangerous it is. So it's not the natural number, it's already with some caution and the caution can be different things. It can be political, it can be people responding by just washing their hands or wearing um, a mouth uh, cover or just having more distance to other people. So that's just also the social component to it. And then um, on the bottom, you see two other parameters that we uh, fit with this. So one is the outbreak delay. So that's just how much in time this happened. And the other one is the detected, uh, the undetected population that you can actually outback from the analysis. So if you look at the outbreak delay, I think we all knew that it kind of started initially on, uh, on the West Coast. So California was actually one of the first places and then also Washington. So that's why it's, this has a delay of zero. And then all of a sudden it appeared in other places. So then you can ask yourself, why is that actually happening? And that is because people are traveling. So if people are not travel, the disease would never get out of a city, say. And so what people have done um, with other diseases and something that we then adopted, is they build a network of how the disease travels. And so the very simple idea um, as a first pass is to say, why don't we use the travel network? So you can use air travel, and this is what this shows. So this is the air travel matrix in the United States. And you can see, this, for instance, California is very well connected. You have Texas, you have Florida, you have New York. So the big cities that are connected well um, are, are in this network, Georgia. Um, and so 
you can create this network based on how many people fly from one place to the other. In this case, this gives you for the 50 nodes, this is the states. Um, we used, we didn't use all the connections, but just the very most traveled ones. So that's the 200 that you see in this picture. And so then for that, we can use, um, we can solve a diffusion equation. So it's really a partial differential equation that has a diffusion term where the diffusion, the parameter of the diffusion depends on the thickness of these lines, which reflect the number of people that travel from one place to the other. So we usually solve diffusion equations with um, or we partial differential equations with finite elements, at least in our group. Um, and then it would just diffuse out, right? So you have a continuous diffusion, say if you're here in California, it would diffuse out and it would just migrate out, out of California. So now this is not what this disease does. It travels fast. So you can imagine if someone wants to go from California to New York, uh, it doesn't go all the way here, but someone jumps on a plane and is there in six hours. So that's why a diffusion finite element model with pure isotropic diffusion doesn't work. So it's a diffusion that's highly nonlinear based on the connections. And this is what this represents. So you can do this and people do this in graph theory and represent the Laplacian term of the partial differential equation. So the graph Laplacian, so that's this term here. And that's really following from the connection. So you calculate the adjacency matrix. It's a big matrix that's populated with the number of flights or people flying from A to B, or in this case, I to J. And then you calculate the degree matrix, which on the diagonal is just how many people come into a state. And this is the degree matrix plotted here. So for instance, in California, you have 100 million people coming and leaving um, at a certain instance in time. So from that, we can then solve this entire set of equations on every node. So we solve these four equations that you see here on every one of these 50 nodes. So we have 200 equations altogether. And then this term here is the diffusion. So how much diffuses say from California to New York in this case, right? And then you solve this problem all together with the 200 unknowns. And then you can actually at every point in time say how many recovered people are in Texas, right? So if you do this, and then this is what you get. Uh, this is the evolution of the disease through uh, the US at, at the first couple of days. And the, um, what we did is we actually ran it back then until day 35 or so, that was about here. And then this figure here is really a projection into the future that we made in, uh, in April or early, late, uh, late yeah, mid-April. So initially you can see, this is New York. So it started in New York. We know all from the news that New York got hit really hard. So here, for instance, on day 30, you can see it's really red. Um, and then what you can also interestingly see, there's a strong connection between New York and California. And because there's a lot of travel, California got relatively quickly noticed this outbreak in New York. You can also see other interesting things. This other red place here is Louisiana. And that's where there was an outbreak because we would probably remember there were some activities, people were going outside, were not careful. So you can see the whole history of the disease in just these maps. So what can you do about it? You probably also all know these pictures. So this is a lot of uh, problems, causing a lot of problems for the uh, air traffic because a lot of companies had to ground their planes. And um, still now, I don't know if any of you have traveled recently. So I actually traveled to Europe about three weeks ago, I came back. I was pretty much the only one on the plane and the entire airport is deserted uh, because all the planes are grounded. So this is a means to control the spreading of the disease which I've just introduced. And a nice example to study, and actually I mentioned that we had um, two postdocs from Germany and Belgium, and they were interested in this, is how can you control the outbreak by just looking at the air traffic? So here's the history of what happened in Europe because Europe officially closed, um, and you probably all know this, um, in, Early, was one of the first um, regions to close. So by March 9, um, all countries were affected with the pandemic. And at that point is when we kind of started the simulations is um, it, Europe was declared the epicenter of the pandemic. Italy was very heavily hit. You probably have seen these movies of uh, the hospitals in Italy. And so then what happened very quickly within just a week is the European Union decided to close all the external borders. So if you look at Europe, so everything in blue is the European Union, everything that's not blue was not allowed to enter Europe. So that's of course very drastic. And when they did it, 
uh, it created a lot of criticism, uh, especially of people who wanted to move freely and said this violates their, their freedom of movement. And so on March 18, this was just within a few days, more than 250 million people were in Europe in lockdown and could not leave the European Union or anybody else coming. So at that point we asked, okay, how, how successful is this? Does this actually help? So we did the same for Europe. So we created this network and you can see the red dots again are the most traveled um, and the biggest countries. So Germany and Spain and Italy and France. And interestingly, the big countries is usually where this happens very fast and very quickly because they're connected so well. There's 27 countries. We represented this to 172 most traveled edges. We looked at the passenger air travel statistics and downloaded this matrix. And from this matrix, again, we created the graph Laplacian. So that's a discrete representation. By the way, if you use um, trust elements uh, of finite elements, you can do the same thing. So if you have a finite element code, you can have a trust network, say here between uh, Finland and Sweden, that would be one trust element. So again, we fit the parameters and you can see um, the key parameter here on the right, the basic reproduction number varied again between three and seven, meaning one person would infect anywhere between three and seven people in this map of uh, Europe. Um, so this was actually quite telling. And then we said, okay, can we fit this? And here again, you can see this fit um, that you've seen already for the US and for China. Um, and you can also see the dynamics. So initially we said, well, when we, when we had the discussion before the presentation, someone said, are these granular models for each country? Yes, they are. So what's interesting is you can see the timeline of different places. So for instance, Austria was very, very strict and you can see that they constrained this very, very hard. The so number went down, number of infectious. So this is orange. People went down very, very quickly where for instance, in France, it was still on the rise. So now we had initially asked the question, how effective were these travel restrictions? So on top, you see um, what happened with the travel restrictions. So that's easy to model because you just drive down the traffic in this big matrix that connects everything. And you can drive it down really by the number of flights. Um, and so you can see here, uh, this is what would have what happened in reality. So this is a timeline between say late March and late April, just in a month, how the disease spread. You see Italy was very heavy hit and then also Spain. So that's why they're in red here. So this on the bottom is what would have happened if there were no travel constraints, if people could travel freely. And you can see Italy again, being somewhat the, the epicenter of the disease, but it would have spread much faster to the entire south of Europe and then also migrated up to the north quicker and along obviously along the travel highways that I've shown in, in this um, airplane connectivity network. So, okay, at that point it was interesting because then the news started to pick this up. So a lot of people in Europe at that point were thinking about opening the borders when the paper came out. And so they were all asking us to kind of give a statement of what do you think should be reopen? How fast should we reopen? Should we reopen only part? And so this was all over the news. And that was actually quite interesting for us because all of a sudden um, we were, we had a model that people <laughs> were interested in, uh, which is exciting, but also at the same time, it kind of was unexpected for us. It was kind of a, 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 a coincidence, I think. And then there's a lot of things here in German, which just happened to be the case because the, the Switzerland, for instance, we went to Swiss radio, was just reopening as one of the first um, countries. So they wanted to know and yeah. At the same time in the US, um, the, the disease was still on the rise. And you probably remember these press briefings um, that happened on a daily basis. And I show this because it's so controversial. So on the top left, you see the different models that have been brought forth by uh, different um, modeling groups. And I'm not saying this to blame any of the groups. I'm just saying that it's really, really, really difficult to make projections. And there's one model in this, this blue, and that's really purely a data fitting model. So that's really data science. It doesn't use any of the ordinary differential equations that we use. And so that model is very smooth as you can see, because it's just really fitting data to, a, you could fit it to any kind of smooth curve as you want. So there's a huge discrepancy. And then we thought, okay, maybe there is really some charge here. Maybe we should also go out and say what these models can and can't do. And we can't just blindly say, okay, we have a model, yet another one, uh, there's already plenty. 
and we have one more. Um, so we thought, okay, let's just see what we can do and confidently share with the community. Remember also, I mean, there's, this is here because New York was very critical in the US and actually Andrew Cuomo, the, the governor of New York had daily press briefings at 9 a.m. And we watched pretty much all of them to kind of see how New York was approaching this curve because you can tell when you're really a modeling person, you can see an interesting point when the curve starts to turn. So there's an inflection point somewhere around here. And you can see that in the data and, and literally that's what happened. So you can actually already see what, what happened before a lay person that looks at the curve knows, okay, that's an inflection point here. I just showing you how unsuccessful these models are. This is the model that was actually used by the CDC. So that's a center for disease control. And these are the cases. So the, black, uh, the blue dots are the cases. And this red is the 25% confidence of the model. So that's actually pretty wide range, right? We usually do 5%, 95%. And this is huge already. And you can see that the day that they published it already, the cases didn't even match in this and even less the death. So there's a model that's predicting death to today where the deaths are already, if you look at this, this is actually a logarithmic range and the deaths are already hugely out of range. And so you ask yourself, okay, really, um, that's when people who initially looked at the model said, are the models actually useful for anything? You're just predicting something. This is dangerous. So then what we did is we actually thought, okay, what's happening here and why the models don't work is because of everything being dynamic. And so we said, can we introduce this parameter here? And this is a parameter how we transfer people from the healthy group to the exposed group and make it time dependent. So you have a time dependency here. So all of a sudden the, the, the model that was there that worked well for the Mises for hundred years, it's becoming time dependent. And this time dependence is a reflection of how the population responds to governmental um, implementations of me uh, measures. So now we have a dynamic contact rate. And for one function that actually works quite well is this hyperbolic tangent type function that Kevin found in our group. And um, from that, you can then derive the reproduction number by just actually this equation, you divide this beta by gamma, gamma being the constant. And this has now four parameters to parameterize the dynamics of the disease. The initial reproduction number, the current reproduction number at any given point, and the time by which the reproduction number is reduced and the slope by which it's reduced. And I'm showing you this here. So this gray on the left is this um, hyperbolic tangent fact type function. You can see um, for instance, the reproduction number is one initially, or in this case, um, five, and it drops down. And by the way by which it drops down is determined by these four parameters. So this first is sensitivity with respect to the initial reproduction number. Here you see the gray going from one to um, 0.5 and how that affects the dynamics. So it's a huge impact. This is, but this we can't change because this is just a disease parameter. This is something we can change. So this is how the population response. So 0 0.4 means people are very, very responsive. And you can see that because this number goes down really rapidly and you can see how it affects all these groups of the disease. You can change the time. So we, I'll show you an example where we see this. So it can happen faster or slower. So this is just shifting this to the left or right. But this is what the effect is on the disease dynamics. So for example, if you shift this to very early, if you respond very quickly, and you shift this curve to the left, then there will be a lot of people safe from the disease. So you only have from one, you probably only have like four or 5% affected. So if you really act fast, you can be very efficient. So why did we choose this function? So here's um, kind of showing why we did this just to explain this a little better. So this is what happens with a constant reproduction number. So this red on top is always the reproduction number. And this is what the initial models used. And you can see, you cannot really fit the data points here. The data points are the dots because if this is constant. It can probably fit an exponential increase, but it can never um, flatten before the entire population got the disease. This is this hyperbolic tangent type function with a, a parameter 4.4 going down to 0 0.4. And it can actually fit this data quite well, as you see. And for those of you who know this map here, this is Austria because Austria had a great control of the disease. Um, we used it uh, early on because it had already gone through the disease pretty quickly. And then here on the right, you see another function that we used quite a bit, and that's a random walk function. And that actually Matthias Pillings in our group came up with. 
Um, and this function has the advantage over the tangent function that it actually can go up again. So at every point, you kind of use a random walk, so it's non-monotonic. So we use these two time-dependent functions. One for being smooth, so this is an analytical solution, so that can be helpful. We also use this sometimes if we want to really be very accurate and if the number goes up again. So this is helpful if the, there's some um, fluctuation. So we work with this from now on. So everything you see is with this dynamic number. Um, here's showing how we really do it. I haven't talked about this yet. All the things I've shown actually use um, Bayesian inference with Mar uh, Mont uh, Markov Monte um, chain Monte Carlo. So these are the parameters that we fit. The first two are the initial conditions of this group, the red group, and the initial conditions of this orange group. You've probably heard of community transmission, so we don't know these groups. These are people that have the disease and don't report, and or people that report, we only know fractions of them. So we actually use the, these parameters and identify them with our analysis because you have a lot of data, so it actually kind of works. This parameter sigma is in a way, if you want um, the difference between or the width of the difference between the measured and the reported data. And then these four parameters, R0, RT, T star, and T are the parameters of the hyperbolic tangent function for the reproduction number. So what's then, what we then do, um, and when I say we, it's really Matthias and Kevin, is uh, to compare the data. So D hat, anything with a hat is the data. So you've probably seen the data. So there's this huge database that comes out of Johns Hopkins. Um, that actually reports these data for all countries, all states, very granular. So this goes into here. And we compare this in, against this D and that's what we actually get out of our model. And we want these two to be as close as possible and Sigma determines in a way how far apart they are. So these are all our um, parameters that we um, draw from this posterior distribution. And then we use um, Bayes' rule to actually um, fit the parameters if you wish. And then this is what we get. So this is for Europe. Um, the white region is the prediction and the gray region is the forecast upon reopening. Um, and that shows a very uh, drastic reopening. So the number returns very quickly to its initial value, a gradual reopening or a remaining closed. And you can see this red being the reproduction number and orange underneath shows you how the population would change. So this is a lot to digest. So you can look at this for probably two hours and still find interesting things. So what you, for instance, see, this is Sweden. Sweden did not have a huge drop in the reproduction number because the, the government decided to actually do nothing about it. They didn't implement any additional measures. They just said, we go through this. We have, in fact, everybody, everybody will be eventually immune because everybody will have passed from susceptible to exposed to infectious to recover in our population. And then there are other countries that are very, very drastic for instance, Austria, you can see the curve goes down very quickly. The number goes from four to below one very rapidly, very, very early in the disease. So actually you can compare this and see quite some, some differences. Um, we can plot this again as a map. Here you see the initial number that we've looked at before. And this is really now the new thing with the dynamics. So this is the current number. So this is how much the government has been able to reduce this number. So. Uh, a low number, blue, would be very, very efficient. So here's Austria. And you can see Austria has been really efficient in reducing this. Here's Sweden. So you can see Sweden has done nothing about it. It's on the order of something above one. And this is the time by which this happens. And that's very interesting because it tells you how fast the population responds to these changes. So now we said, okay, we know all this, but can we relate this to travel? Can we relate what we see to what you see um, in the travel matrix. So interestingly, if you look at this red here, and that's reported by Eurocontrol. So that's the reported data that we downloaded from the internet. So this red here is the weekly average travel. And interestingly, this looks exactly like the hyperbolic tangent function that we used for the reproduction number. The blue here is the travel before, so from the, um, 2019. And the dark blue is from, um, uh, from 2020 from now, you can see a drop here by more than 90%. So that's really huge. So then we were interested in, okay, how does this curve sit in the time with respect to the reproduction number? And how steep is this with respect to the reproduction number? And this is what Kevin plotted for you here. So the reproduction number is in red, 
And then the dots are really the data that I just shown, but now granular resolved for every country. And you can see the shaded region in between is the responsiveness. So because we have a function that had an inflection point, and as I said, I mean, for us, it's kind of easy to understand what an inflection point is. We can use a function to approximate the flight data and have an inflection point here. And then we use the function for the reproduction number in red and have an inflection point. And we just measure the time difference between these two inflection points. Another data set that's also interesting is the data that is reported on cell phone data. You've probably heard that Apple conducted, was well, the first, now Google also has this, conducted a huge um, publication or study. They published all the requests on cell phone data and Apple was the first that so we just used their data um, starting um, in early February. And this is just how people move. So it's walking, it's a car and it's um, transit. And you can see interestingly around zero initially. So this is baseline. It dropped by about 70%. And this is really how people move, right? This is not about the flying. This is really a response of individual people. And then so somewhere in April, it had the very bottom and then it goes up again. So this is just showing for Germany, but if you look at the website, it's all available. It looks pretty much the same for many other countries. So if you understand to read this, you will ask why all of a sudden is there more mobility in June, right? Because it's above baseline. So you can explain this because for instance, people use cars more than they would use planes to get from one place to the other. But also in the summer, there's generally a lot of mobility that's associated with travel and vacation. So that's actually becoming very dangerous now. So if you look at all these data, so this is air traffic in purple and then walking, driving and transit in black, blue and gray. And compared to the red function, we can um, calculate the responsiveness with respect to everything, including walking and driving and all that. And you get this big matrix. So this is the all countries of the European Union. The population R0 is the number when initially the disease was described as poor. RT is most countries have now brought it under one. And this is the responsiveness in the time parameter. So it's interesting because they're all on the order of two weeks. So anything you do will affect, if you're strict enough, will affect the disease dynamics two weeks out. So whatever you do now will happen in two weeks. And you can see that in the data in, in about 10 days to two weeks. This is plotted in color again, and this is in graphs. And you can see, for instance, if you plot all these parameters in graphs, that Sweden plays a critical role because they're actually an outlier in all these four parameters. And that's by choice, the government had decided to really do nothing about it. So for instance, their reproduction number is still above one. Um, this is the relative air traffic and the relative driving mobility going up beyond May. And so initially we wrote this paper with uh, Kevin um, around this time when this was all going down and we said, oh, it's all flat line, right? If you only look until May, we thought, okay, well, this tangent function works very well. But then all of a sudden people started to drive again. So air traffic is still pretty down to 10% of its initial value. But driving went up again. So actually, then we got the reviews and people were saying, well, what are you doing? Actually, this is going up. And that's what I said earlier. I mean, this is data that's currently happening. So you always have to respond to this. And so then um, Kevin made this plot in, it's a heat map of the driving mobility that you see on the left and the effective reproduction number on the right for all countries. And you see two trends. So the first is the red here in driving when it drops from high to low reflects itself in the reproduction about two, two weeks later. So every block here is one week. So you can see this drops about two weeks later. So that's the responsiveness I've talked to, I've talked about. And then another interesting fact is the mobility in driving goes up again, starting around mid-May, but the reproduction number remains low. So that's good news, right? People are driving and still are not infecting each other very drastically. So we said, can we actually use this to stratify the disease and generally understand the disease dynamics better, looking at inflection points. So this is the first wave. We have an inflection time point in red in the mobility, that's this red line. And then we have an inflection point in the reproduction number R, that's this blue dot and this blue dotted line. And like I said before, the time difference, the delay is this delta T, this two weeks. There's other two interesting points. So when the reproduction number drops below one, so that's in this entire wave row here, then the number of cases is a maximum and goes down to the minimum. So this, this reproduction number turning points of one indicate a maximum and a minimum in the number of cases. 
and as the reproduction number is now going up above one, the number of cases increases and we have a second wave. So we can stratify this. And Kevin did this for all countries. So you see this below here, how long is every country in phase one, two, and three? And many countries now are actually in this third wave, uh, in the second wave, where the reproduction number is increasing, number of cases is increasing. And so that's actually very critical. Uh, you can do a lot of data analysis, just to, this is just to show how much you can do um, and how different the results are if you use different intervals. For instance, if you fit over different data intervals here from red to blue, you can have different levels of correlation between traffic and um, uh, reproduction. And you get the best fit if you only use the small interval. So it tells you that at some point, mobility and reproduction become really decorrelated. Um, here you can see these waves and the adaptation times again for these countries. So in gray is the, is the first wave, in white is the tightest control. And then in gray again, you see the beginning of the second wave. And then for all these fits, you can identify this time adaptation um, this is the, the resulting time adaptation for all 10 countries. And again, it's on the order of two weeks. So that's kind of your take home. What's interesting is people are now asking, and you probably heard this, um, what happens if you actually take into account the population that we don't see? And so we enhance the model and we fit also not just the cases, but also the death. So this blue is the death curve. And by fitting the cases and the death, you can in a way identify, read out of the data what you don't see. So there's an asymptomatic transmission and this model takes into account both the asymptomatic transmission and also how much we can detect this testing. So we've probably heard, especially if you live in the US, this discussion about how much do we need to test? Does testing increase um, the number of sick people? Obviously not. And you can see this here. So this is broken down by countries for Europe. This is the detection fraction. So de detection fraction is how many um, people do we detect? And that's on the order of one out of seven. So you can see it's about 15%. And this is the case fatality rate. So this is really out of the people who are sick, how many people will eventually die? And that varies hugely. So between like 4% and 17% of the people that are reported sick. So you can back all this information per country out of the data. Now, this is a study that we did with Matthias, and this is actually showing how these um, asymptomatic uh, models work. So you not only have the population that is symptomatic, the orange one, but in parallel, you have an asymptomatic population that you don't see. So the asymptomatic population does the same thing, but it goes through this green um, invisible state because we never see these people. And that's really dangerous. Because if you look at these three cases, and these were just the three that reported asymptomatic transmission first, you can see that actually this orange is just this very tiny little line at the bottom, whereas the green, this um, asymptomatic population is much, much larger. And in fact, studies have shown that the undercount is really 20. So this green population here is 20 times larger than what we actually see. So there's 20 more, more people for every person that we record, there's on the order of maybe 20 is a bit high, but people now agree it's probably between eight and 12 or 15 people that we don't see. So that's actually quite interesting. So with that, I come to the last uh, part of the talk. And this is really just an example where we can use it and where we have used it. And this is just an interesting story that I want to share. And this is work um, that Kevin has done. And this is together with Proton Raman, and he's an epidemiologist in the province of Newfoundland in Canada. And this work also with Alain Gourielli, who's in the UK. And Alain is consulting for the government on COVID. So he was actually a good partner in crime to actually understand this. So here's the story about Newfoundland. For those of you who don't know, it's the second smallest Canadian province. It has a very small population on a large area. So it's about half a million. 92% um, live on the province of um, Newfoundland, which is the island, and then also part of the province is Labrador, which is the country or the, the part that's attached to the mainland of Canada. Um, this is a population that's very um, susceptible to the disease, has high obesity, overweight, unhealthy lifestyle. They found the first case mid-March, like many other countries. Um, and then there was a huge uh, super spreading event that caused about 260 cases. And then on May 4th, um, they issued a travel order restrict or travel ban, meaning that nobody could enter the province. 
At that day, actually within the province, the number of cases had decreased to zero. So we're now in a situation um, in early June, July, when we started the study and working with them, there were no cases. So the entire island was free of COVID, which was interesting. It had gone to a little wave, but at that point there was nothing. And so then um, people who lived there uh, were actually starting to sue. And there was um, a collective um, lawsuit against the government because these people felt like they wanted to get in or out. And so we worked with um, the Attorney General of Newfoundland, uh, Justin Mellon, who actually was the defendant in this case, and he was trying to defend this decision. Here's a network that you've already seen a lot. In this case, we only needed the in and outcoming um, flights to Newfoundland, so it's not a completely connected network. And as you can see, Newfoundland is here. Um, and so these are the flights. And there are three different networks, in fact. So one is what's called the Atlantic provinces. So these are only the three most closely um, connected provinces to Newfoundland. This is dark blue. And then there's Canada. So that's all the blue lines. And then there's the rest of North America, which is the US, it's the red network. So we have these three networks and we did this because there was an interesting um, suggestion to actually open Newfoundland to just these Atlantic provinces, to only Canada or to all of North America. So this is the travel, the air travel um, of these different places. And you see Newfoundland Labrador here in dark blue. And Newfoundland is this island here, this is Labrador. So we're talking about mainly this island where most of the population is living. You can see a lot of traffic coming from Ontario and Quebec, which is these two provinces. Alberta is this province and then Florida, interestingly. And this is very interesting because Florida, unfortunately, was also the state at that time you might remember that had the highest case numbers in the US. So this is just showing Canada if you're not familiar. So we're looking at Newfoundland, this is this part. Um, the Atlantic provinces are um, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and um, like these, these uh, regions that you here see here and New Brunswick. So we're talking about opening this, which is called the travel bubble, the Atlantic travel bubble, to, or to entire, the entire Canada. So we ran a simulation, Kevin did this, on uh, all these different provinces and territories of Canada, so that's 13. And you can see the case numbers are super, super low. Canada has very low case numbers still. And especially in these four blue Atlantic provinces, the numbers are super low. So the infected population is almost zero everywhere. The recovered population is really, really small. You can't even calculate a reproduction number because there's no gradient to this, right? Um, and then there are some provinces of the bigger provinces that actually do, do have cases. You can see that here. It's another question is what happens if you open. In parallel, we did all this for the US and now you can see actually there are larger, much larger numbers here, right? Larger populations that are infected, larger um, actually reproduction numbers. And this is the air travel to Newfoundland. This is multiplying the air travel per day with the number of people that are in this red group exposed and in this orange group infected. And so you can see this map here showing the most exposed travelers are coming from Florida here and from Texas. And this is the infectious group, so the orange group, the most infectious pro um, travelers are also coming from Florida and from Texas. And in fact, you can number it. So this is, for instance, 0 0.19 a day. So altogether, if you sum this up, you know how many infected people would come into the country if you were to open at that very point and you can project that forward, what would happen and how the disease would evolve from zero. And that's what we've done here. So this is fitting the cases. This is fitting the total number of cases. And in white here, you see the projection. And the projection takes into account a full quarantine. So everybody who comes in, this is 100% quarantine and not walking out of the house. And that's what most countries actually recommend. But then really people wouldn't obey this. A lot of people would just go out and would just, you know, nobody really checks on this. And so then we said, okay, what happens if only 50% quarantine? You can see there's also an, already an increase. And then what if nobody quarantines? And you can see because of the exponential function, this would hugely increase. And then we compare this quarantining on top, which people have suggested, with actually opening only to the blue, which is the Atlantic provinces, to the light blue, which is Canada, or to the red, which is North America. And you can see 
that really opening to America is super, super critical, right? Because then the case numbers go up very, very rapidly. And you can actually name the numbers if this were to follow this model. So you can see on top is the study of quarantine and below is the study of opening the bubbles. And what this shows is you want this to be very much to the right. If you open only the Atlantic province, this happens very, very slowly. So that's the rightmost curve. If you open to all of North America, and even if you quarantine 95%, so only 5% violate quarantine requirements, you will hit 0.1% of the total population in before end of September. So this is actually what, what they were really interested in knowing. And so we calculated when, at which point does this hit 0.1% of the total population of Newfoundland. And this is the interval of days that it takes. And you can see the safest is really keeping it close to only the Atlantic provinces. So this is closing uh, and this is real. So this is Proton, our collaborator Proton Raman. He testified in court last week, just last Friday, the, the trial was over. And all this, what you see here was all over the news. Um, and that was last week. So this was really using these models to explain and to understand um, what the effect would be of opening the country. And so he was actually an expert witness in the trial. So we were not allowed to talk to him for the entire last week, but then on Friday he came off the stand and then um, he basically reported back that a lot of people were interested in the models. So coming back to the initial paper and the title of Lessons of the Pandemic, um, it was actually already known what I've just said, and it's kind of obvious in 1990 that the only one and only way to present, prevent the disease is by establishing absolute isolation. It is necessary to shut off those um, who are capable of giving the virus from those who are capable of being infected or vice versa. This is a very difficult procedure. And so it's not just to know this, but the fact is that we actually have to be very careful about it and we, it's very difficult to implement. So I want to close by just saying what we learned. So um, as Jigan mentioned, we have a, a paper that's coming out as a summary of this talk. So these are my 10 take home lessons that we kind of learned from the modeling that were to us at least not um, known at the beginning. So in the outbreak dynamics, the virus spreads exponentially if it's uncontrolled. I think a lot of people know this, but the exponent we have actually now been trying to find that is really, really high and dangerous. Um, it's as contagious as previous coronaviruses. So this R number is close to what people have reported for other diseases. Um, and without vaccination, there's very little we can do because if you look at the numbers, less than 5% have gone from here to here. So 95% are still in this group, right? And only if we vaccinate them will we reduce this number. So the good news is we've actually learned that we can flatten the curve that was in March, April, that wasn't even clear if we could reduce the curve. Now we're confident that we can do it. Um, we also know that mobility is a drastic way to do this. It's very drastic. It cuts into people's lives, but it's very effective. It has a time delay of about two weeks to implement. So that's something that we showed with a study. Um, we also know that a lot of cases are asymptomatic, but we can use data science or data analysis or data-driven modeling to actually study the effect of this asymptomatic group that we otherwise wouldn't see. We have a lot of data, but what I haven't really talked about is it's difficult to align the data with this model because it doesn't come reported at S-E-I-R. So you have to be very thoughtful of how you populate the initial conditions and these compartments initially and how you read the data to compare. And then most interesting now is the exit strategies to how do, do we get out of the whole thing? And there are selective reopening, um, like we've seen for Canada where you have these travel bubbles and then it's also quarantining. And I think um, we all agree that testing is critical for safe reopening. So we have to test to actually reduce the number of asymptomatic people and to know more about this number that's about 10 times larger than what we actually see. So the more we test, the more we identify this, this group of people. Um, one thing I wanted to close with, and I think that's very important because we're all modeling people. One thing I, we have learned is you have to ask the right questions. A lot of people in the news now say models are useless and we kind of know because we love modeling, all of us, I guess, um, that that's not the case. But what really is important here is you have to ask the right questions. So you can't really ask, project the disease uh, three months into the future because nobody can do that. But you can ask, what is the effect of changing this parameter? And that's something we can confidently answer with the model. Another thing is, 
what's the true size of the affected population? People say, okay, well, what is the asymptomatic transmission? What, what is the size? We can't know this and really we can't answer this. But what we can answer is how does the size of the asymptomatic transmission change the trajectory and change what we need to do? So that's something we can do with the model. Um, a lot of people ask how homogeneous does it spread? So is it like an isotropic spreading or is it affecting different groups of the population differently? That's again, a very high level question that we can't really answer. So we can, for instance, answer um, what is the most vulnerable population? Are children more vulnerable than adults with this model? This, and you can quantify that with the model. Will there be a second wave? So that's another question people talk about, right? I think what's more important and what actually models can answer is um, how do increased mobility and seasonality impact RT, this reproduction number? And then what people really want to know is can we prevent a research? And that of course models can't predict because they can't predict how people behave. But an answer for something we could for instance answer is what is the critical reproduction number beyond which we can no longer manage the disease with test isolate trace? And that's something a model can actually give you an answer to. So I think this is like many things and this is very general to modeling. You have to find the right questions. And if you find the right questions, models can be incredibly useful. Um, here, just a couple of references. So they are all on Med Archive, if people are interested. And we also be teaching a class on this at Stanford. So if anybody is interested in taking this class, just send us an email and we can add you to the class list that will start in about a month. And I want to close with this. Um, because a lot of this literature, and that's also something that our community is not so familiar with, is on Med Archive servers or just preprint servers. And many of our papers, if you've seen that too, are were initially published on preprint servers. And there's a lot of caution because a lot of people use these preprint papers. There's oh, in COVID-19 alone, there's probably 10,000 without like literally 15,000 within the last uh, four or five months. And you really have to be careful um, because everybody can put everything there. And so this was interesting because in response to this trial last week, someone wrote, and I put it there because it was in a local newspaper. Um, and this is actually the editor of one of the cell press journals wrote about our paper, which back then was only on the preprint server was accepted for publication and peer reviewed during that time. So he didn't know, but I think this is really making us cautious in this moment of time, um, a lot of people turn to models. A lot of people take preprint server papers as a grain of salt and that, uh, as a ground truth. And you have to really take this with a grain of salt. And so the last sentence was I want, want to close with, in times when leaders should turn to science rather than politics to make policy and so, um, societal decisions, we want to, um, the underlying science to be as truthworthy as possible. So I think that's kind of the last warning remark I have uh, when using preprint server papers and sometimes even peer reviewed work. Thank you all. Okay, I guess uh, applause is uh, in order. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. This was a fascinating, a wonderful talk. Uh, we have, of course, uh, plenty of time for questions. I have a few myself, but I think I'll let uh, the audience uh, uh, start the uh, ball rolling. Zigang, how do we uh, identify the people wanting to ask questions? People can raise their real hand or there is a blue button they can click. Okay, I, I... let's see the button here. Uh, so, Pradeep, you probably can see uh, David uh, wait already. There was yes. a blue yes, I, I do that. I was there. So uh, David, uh, I guess if you if you can hear us, uh, please go ahead, ask your question and uh, maybe introduce yourself, uh, uh, your institution before you ask the question. Okay, I'm Dave Waits. I'm at Harvard. Uh, Ellen, thank you so much. Um, uh, let me apologize for not hearing all of the talk. What I heard was great. And I'm going to ask you a question that probably doesn't have to do with modeling, but it's just something I don't completely understand. Let me say I'm not a modeler. I'm just a simple minded experimentalist. But you tell me that, um, so I can do simple calculations. That's all I can do. You tell me that it could be as high as 20, a times 20, the number of people who've been infected compared to the number of people we know about. And the US has more than 5 million infected people. So if I multiply 5 million by 20, 
they get 100 million. And that's like close to a third of the population. So if that's the case, are we getting toward some kind of herd immunity and we don't know it? Or are the numbers that I'm using just too simple-minded and am I being just my usual stupid self? I'm not nodding because I want to <laughs> agree that you're stupid. <laughs> but you can, it's okay, I don't mind. <laughs> I think it's a very, a very um, important question and people actually ask this question. Um, especially, so these studies, these um, uh, asymptomatic studies are hugely controversial and I didn't touch on it much. We've been working with someone here at Stanford who is known for doing this, John Iordanes. So he's actually done a lot of um, asymptomatic studies and published on this. Um, and it's been hugely controversial. So for instance, the most controversial, and that agrees with your numbers, is in New York, when they did this study, they found that 25% of the population, you probably know this, have already gone through the disease. Um, with a reproduction number of four, herd immunity would be on the order of 80%. So it's still away from it. Um, but that would be actually good news, right? I mean, nobody would be upset to know that already one fourth of our population have gone through this. I think in places where like New York, um, where it's very densely populated, where you really have had high case numbers, um, this is probably more the case than in rural areas of the US. And that's probably safe to say. Um, and I think those places are very far from herd immunity. I wouldn't say New York is close to herd immunity really at this point. And I wouldn't say it's safe to think we are anywhere close. Um, but your numbers are right. So that's the numbers that people actually are using. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we're close to your immunity and the last third or two thirds or whatever is factor of two is still very uh, yeah, yeah. terrible. So I'm not saying that. It's just, uh, it seems to me there are a lot more, it sounds like there's a lot more infected people than we know about. So a good, a, good, a good way to think of it is, um, we probably all know about Sweden. So Sweden thought, okay, we go through this quickly, brutally, and then we reach herd immunity. So even in Sweden, only say two or 3% of the population have gone through this, and that would only mean 30, 40%. So they're really still very far from this. And also at that point, it becomes more difficult to reach this other tail of the population, obviously, right? I mean, because you're already kind of, the first, usually that it's very um, heterogeneous, right? It affects people, um, first responders or essential workers at a very high rate. And people who are in their houses will probably never get it. So I think in that sense, herd immunity is also kind of difficult word because it's not the entire population is homogeneously affected um, just or exposed to it, right? Well, thank you very much for your talk uh, and for the modeling view, it's great, thanks. Thanks, David, for your question. Uh, Yu Hang, uh, I think you had uh, raised your hands. Could you reduce yourself and ask your question? Thank you, Pradeep. Thank you, Adam, for the beautiful talk. It's a very good example of uh, using models. So I just have a, a question of this uh, R, um, uh, R, R parameter. So uh, you uh, make a very uh, beautiful correlation to the travel uh, and uh, um, uh, spreading. So I think uh, um, uh, now maybe this uh, uh, community spreading is more important, uh, uh, more influencing uh, factors. So in, do you think this R can be used uh, to uh, make a data uh, uh, relevance to the prediction? And if so, how do we interpret uh, this uh, uh, physical relevance or mechanism of this R, what uh, um, maybe it's out of uh, the scope of your work. But I just don't want to uh, ask whether you have thought about uh, uh, all the relevant uh, things related to interpretation of this R. That's a really, really great point. And I think it goes, so I try to focus on the R, our simulation, because we have a lot of data and we fit a lot of parameters can also make statements about community transmission. So for instance, just as a natural byproduct, you can trace back the disease and we can say with a certain confidence the disease was present in California already in January, although the first reported case was on February 8. Um, and that's just by um, adding uncertainty on the simulation and then you can go backwards in time and actually say, if your initial conditions have a certain uncertainty on top of it, when did it start? So there are things that we can actually back out of the simulation. And we did, I did a sit and show it. 
But for example, that's one of them. So you can go back in time and say, when was the first case most likely in this region? And then you can draw conclusions about con community uh, transmission, what you just asked. And there's a lot of things also that, I mean, other dynamic parameters, like you indicated. I focus on R because it's the one that we kind of see in the news most, right? But um, there's other things that actually we identify with it. There's a lot of data. Um, you have to be careful with the data, obviously, to map it into the right bins. Um, but you can actually gain quite some insight beyond just R. Yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, Christine, sorry, uh, if I may, I want to have a follow up question. So, do you see this as uh, um, uh, one example of using these differential equations of your model that you talk about uh, uh, having relevance to your previous study? Or do you envision? Uh, so uh, this is going to be a lot of uh, um, uh, other things and more work you would like to work on uh, still uh, in this direction. I mean, I should actually give all the credit to our co-workers because we don't have any funding for this. We did this out of sheer curiosity on the side. <laughs> and um, I think we will continue this as much as we have time and um, energy and, and to understand this. And there's a lot of questions we can ask. So for instance, the last study with Canada came up because people just approached us and we just thought this is a really interesting problem. Um, but I mean, it's not that all our group will now all of a sudden go into epidemiology modeling. I do think though that um, modeling will remain interesting. Uh, just like Dave asked, I think there's gonna be months where models can still be very important because now for instance, we'll ask ourselves, just think about now we have a vaccination, who do we vaccinate first, right? Or very obvious question now, how do we open the schools? How do we close? How many people do we need to trace? Do we need to trace first contacts only or also second con uh, contacts? How long do we need to lock people up? So there's a lot of things that we actually now learn that we can actually use to, to model situations that are real right now. And that will probably be real for, I would think at least uh, another year or so. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Tahir, uh, I believe you have a question. Go ahead, please. Sure. Uh, Tahir Saif from University of Illinois. Uh, Ellen, good to see you. And a wonderful example of models giving futuristic uh, concepts what to do next. Uh, so the question, I have two questions. Um, one uh, is that, is it, is it uh, uh, something that we can draw a conclusion that no matter where we are in terms of the number of currently infected people uh, in a given community, if we open up the community, eventually we will have the same number of people infected over a long time. Uh, in other words, uh, if you apply the restrictions to staying at home and so on, yes, you will see less and less people being reported as infected because the transmission has been reduced, but there'll be always a few left the disease is transmitting one from the other in a very, very slow pace. Then at some point, if you open up, is it plausible that eventually we'll have the same result as what Sweden did uh, without doing anything? Uh, in other words, the, the, uh, the area under the curve remains the same. It is over a long time or over a short time. It's a very pessimistic view of the, of, of the world that we are in now, right? Uh, so do you want to die early or do you want to die later? But the question is, you know, what's the price of later death by being at home, stuck at home? And then I have another question, but if, if Pudip allows me, I will ask the next question. But... Oh, yeah. So let me just answer this then. Um, so I think living in California, we have seen this. If anybody is from California, you know that this was like the first um, state to shut down very drastically, actually, especially where we live, live. Santa Clara was the first county in the U.S. to shut down. Mm -hmm. um, that was great because, of course, we didn't have any early cases, just a handful, and similar to Newfoundland. But then now, of course, under the pressure, we're opening again, and, and we see exactly what you said, right? I mean, it's just the same thing happening um, just later in time, in a way. So you have, obviously, just a, a, one single person comes in, or five, mm -hmm. and then you see this happening. Um, also, I mean, I, when you ask, is it, does it take one I think one doesn't necessarily need to create an outbreak, right? There's always like a lot of noise. And of course in the model one creates an outbreak because it's just the model. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality that one person probably never infects anyone. So we don't really know. So there's also a huge non-linearity in the dynamics. Mm -hmm. Probably heard about these super spreading events. 
so that that one person can all of a sudden create an explosion or not. So there's a lot of unknown that we really um, shouldn't confidently say we can model because we really can't. Mm -hmm. um, but what you're saying is true because there's some kind of patterns that seem to be just very universal to this disease and they just happen no matter whether there's a huge governmental shutdown or not. I think it just seems to be somewhat universal, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not really a disease expert, right? I'm just saying it from whatever we have learned and from the modeling set. I see Alain, maybe Alain wants to comment on this. He's a co-author on our paper and he is actually um, advising on the British government side. So maybe Alain can comment a little bit. Can we give him the... Oh, you, you're, doing, you're doing well. I don't have anything particular to, to add to. It was a great lecture, by the way. <laughs> Uh, uh, Tahir, you already depressed us with a question. I'm not sure we should let you do a follow-up question. <laughs> Go ahead. You, had a, you said you had a follow-up on... A... Yeah, I have been looking at this question for a long time. Is uh, More on the biology side, is that do we know how many virus we need to infect someone? Because it eventually would lead to uh, the more basics of the origin of R0 or RT in your model. So is it five fighters enough? Is it hundred needed? Um, so you know, if if someone is spreading, uh, so do we do we have any idea what is the threshold for infectability? Uh, no, I don't. From a biology end, I don't. I don't think that's. Known I, have, I have looked at many papers. I, I cannot find any which which would say. This is the barrier, right? this is the limit. I, I mean, I don't think. I think it's like with everything. I mean, what you learn when you look at this is it's a lot of really statistics mm. and distribution, right? I mean, I, I don't think you can confidently say it's yeah. one milliliter or... Yeah, yeah. it's not... That makes, it, that makes it so difficult, right? That yeah. even yeah. like the, the end of the Gauss curve can actually do something here because it, it's an exponential growth. And I guess all of us know what exponential growth means. And that mm. makes it so incredibly dangerous. Yeah, but if, you, if we would know something about this, this fundamental, then maybe we could take other measures in addition to you know, isolation, contact tracing, and so on, which would reduce, let's say, the droplet size that is being spread. So if the droplet size becomes less than 50 microns, it may contain two of the virus particles. If it is 100 microns, it may carry a thousand of them. Right? So there could be other physical barriers one could think uh, to stop the spreading. In addition to, and everything looks like what, what people respond to really controls the RT, the, the R0 or the current value of R. So the responsiveness is reflected in the models. If, if we know something more about how it spreads, how it goes from point A to point B, uh, then we might take physical measures which would eventually reflect on R and then everything follows from there. But I think this is a more microbiology question. Yeah, I guess we are more the, the larger, yeah. like mm -hmm. this, this spreading between like different right. cities, countries. I think this, I agree, this is more the biochemistry and probably it looks similar, but I, I wouldn't know. We haven't looked into that. I think. Yeah, okay. So, Huajen, uh, I have you next on my list. Uh, uh, Huajen, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Pradeep. Oh, hi, Alan. It's great to see you here. <laughs> That's great talk. So, uh, I like your comments about you know, the modeling is so complex, such a complex, complex problem. So it's it's very important to learn to ask the right question. So I'm not sure the following question is uh, because it's on our a uh, lot of people's mind is the vaccination, right? The vaccine is coming. We heard there's uh, 15 or 16 different vaccines being tried. Can you model? Can you build this uh, vaccination as a as a factor or variable in your model to explain uh, how effective the vaccine need to be? in order for us to you know, con fully control this uh, spread of COVID-19. And also, they, we know the, uh, um, the virus is, uh, is mutating, right? It's mutating pretty quickly. So is it better to have vaccination simultaneously uh, across different countries, Europe, North America, and Asia? Or uh, how, how does this thing work, right? Can you can you model give some give some guidance of uh, uh, how the vaccination should be uh, most effectively operated? So I guess when you vaccinate, so this group that we start with, it was the red initial group. There was one. I think you bring yeah. this group down in a way, right? You have a smaller susceptible group, um, and then if you do this um, 
to a large enough group of people, and I think that's what uh, Dave asked initially, is you can actually push that into herd immunity if you have a lot of people vaccinated. You can right. go to a very extreme where you vaccinate enough people to eradicate the disease entirely, right? That's what happened um, with one or two diseases knowingly with a huge campaign. Yeah, but I that's, don't think that's probably yeah. what we're seeing here. That'll be a way ahead. So the way you would right. model it, I think, is you would you would reduce the susceptible population. Um, I think it would be interesting. What, what's an interesting question here is if you look at different subgroups of the population, you can ask, okay, who should we vaccinate first, right? Should that be the most um, the most vulnerable people or the people that travel most, right? If you only have mm -hmm. this amount of money to vaccinate uh, or vaccination to give, would you first vaccinate the people in the nursing homes that are really vulnerable to the disease or the people that travel that actually are the essential workers that work with them? And I think those are questions that you can probably use the model to answer. Um, but then you need a granular breakdown of the population into these uh, risk groups, right? Or age groups, for example. Yeah. But, but the problem is we also heard the vaccine is not 100% effective. And besides, since the virus is mutating, you may need to uh, develop a new vaccine constantly, right? So there's a pace of this virus mutation and uh, the, the speed of vaccination. Could, could you make some projection uh, based on some modeling or, or well, some comments? I I think it's all very difficult to predict right now because we don't yeah. even know how effective these vaccines okay. will be, right? But yeah. I think you can you can always say, okay, if they're 80% effective, this is what you'd see. Um, and that will probably guide some, sometimes the, the okay. easiest models already guide something. But you're right. I mean, we're all hoping for the vaccination to solve mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. but and just waiting until it's there. Okay. But I mean... So it's very difficult to say, right? How hard to yeah, go. I would, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Joanna, uh, you're next. Uh, please introduce yourself. I'm Joanna Eisenberg from Harvard University. And I have one question, maybe one and a half. Um, whether you have made any uh, calculations or um, used the model as age-related dynamics and whether um, different age uh, bins would have different R numbers? And if so, whether your models better reproduce a certain age more so than other ages? So um, I should say we have not yet done this. Um, you would have to be granular. So we use this model that we have. Uh, where we use just different nodes to represent different places. You can just also be granular about the different bins and have these bins for different age groups. Um, I think what's difficult to do is and all of a sudden you have a big matrix. So if you just, I can just pull up this model again in a way to just show what I'm, I'm talking about. So in this model, you would then um, have a matrix that actually has this cross correlations, right? So this beta is a factor, how much do some people in the infectious group infect others? And then this beta would become a matrix between the different age groups. So how likely is a zero to 10 year old going to affect a 70 to 80 year old, right? So this would be a whole group, like if you have 10 year age group, then beta would be a 10 by 10 matrix. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why we haven't done this, and I think it's important, very important to do is there's very little information how this matrix would be populated. Um, so saying the question would then really be, how likely are young people going to affect old people? How likely are old people going to affect old people? So we just didn't do that because we didn't have the information. But the question is, is incredibly important, and I agree. What models could do is just do a what if, right? You could say, okay, what if um, children in this age group are less infectious, but this group is very, very infectious on all others? So I think that's something that we should actually look into. That's a, that's a great point. In particular, the, the first question that they Waits asked, will the unreported numbers or at least hidden cases, asymptomatic cases would be completely different in different age groups? Yeah. Which then uh, should somehow affect the spreading of the, uh, of the disease. And in fact, what happens to big families? If there is one person sick in the family, obviously exposed to entire family. Is there statistics that tells us that entire family will definitely get sick or not? 
Yeah, obviously, the, the, I mean, people are collecting this data right now, and you probably always also follow the news, especially with school opening. A lot of people follow the, the kids, how infectious are the children. Um, and I think in that sense, it's a really, really important question. And I think we will learn more about this effect um, because we're gradually opening the schools, right? So we'll learn how this is carried from the schools back into the families. I think that's a good point. And then it's time to really adjust the model and build that in. I think then we have a good database on that. Thank you so much. Uh, Brian, uh, you're up next. Uh, hello, Ellen. Um, that was an absolutely lovely talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you. Uh, the the um, correlation that you um, have established between travel and what happens two weeks later is really very impressive. Um, so you have all the travel data, which is good. Um, so here's my question. I'm sorry, it's, it's following the theme of the uh, previous couple of speakers, asking you about things that you didn't speak about, which is sort of unfair. Um, the uh, travel statistics tell us about how frequently different people come into contact with one another, and that's obviously a factor in the spread. Uh, a second intuitively uh, appealing factor is uh, what happens when they are in contact which I suppose is a question of how they behave when they are in contact. And behavior can include all kinds of things like um, how close they get to one another physically, uh, whether they're speaking and laughing, uh, whether they're wearing a mask, whatever. So, uh, are people, um, the, the question is this, uh, is there enough good data about human behavior to do something analogous to what you have done to try to identify how effective behavioral modification is in controlling the spread. And part B is, uh, is it possible to correlate such data with um, public policy to see whether public policy actually influences behavior and whether behavior influences probability of spread given contact? I think it's a very, very important question and actually um, that's what we asked ourselves when you see that, I mean, this two week thing is a nice, nice fit, but obviously when you have a lot of data, you can also correlate it to other things that we haven't yet done, right? So if there were data that would say, okay, for instance, how many people are wearing a face covering, um, then you could see, does that affect something in a similar way? This would be an interesting one. And that would probably be relatively simple to study. Um, one really important factor is probably how close do we get to each other. I think we're all trying to be very far away from each other now. Um, that's one, that's a behavior change. There's a lot of behavior changes in this that people have argued. And I think that's a little bit um, what I was trying to, to um, share with um, this paper. I can just share it again. So this is the heat map that kind of changed very drastically initially. And that shows a good correlation in dropping but it, this is really a behavior change because you can see driving goes up really, really drastically again. And the reproduction number remains relatively low, which I would say is actually good news, right? Because there all of a sudden you don't see the same correlation. So this is really learning. So the reason why this remains blue is exactly what you're saying. This is, we have learned to change our behavior. We wear face covering, we don't get close to people, we actually distance ourselves, we don't use public transport that much as we probably need to. So I think this is already a good sign, actually, if you want, right? This is the good news that there are some natural things happening. Can you quantify that? I think that's a really, really difficult question to answer, but, but a good one, actually, yeah. So uh, Alan, before I call upon the next person, uh, I have a quick question for you. Uh, so obviously in your model, there are some parameters which might be, for lack of a better word, we might say they are constitutive parameters that are specific to the coronavirus pandemic. But how general is your model in the sense that if the next pandemic comes along or the, hopefully not, <laughs> or the third one, is your model could be to then used exactly for that? But of course you have to change the constitutive parameters, you know, the ones that are specific to the, uh, the, this, this virus. Otherwise, the system of equations you have, the, the differential equations and everything, they should be applicable to almost all pandemics, right? Yeah, I and mean, I think that's what's so interesting, that actually people use this for the flu. People use this type of model. I think the first time it was um, published was in 1927. So that's almost 100 years ago. Um, and so that's when people started using these compartments. 
there's some kind of agreement and disagreement how many of these compartments you have. Like we said, we have one for the asymptomatic population. You can have one for people who actually die of the disease and take them out of this. So um, that is just like slight tweaks and modifications, but the whole concept I think should be very general. And the parameters probably are somewhat comparable because people now compare these parameters, like this transition from one bucket to the next. People say, okay, how universal is this to other diseases, to coronavirus diseases, to the flu, um, to the measles. Um, and so you can learn quite something. And it, it, a lot of things are relatively common among these diseases, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the, uh, Howard, you're up next. Uh, please introduce yourselves. Uh, hi, Howard Stone. Um, I know many people on the call, so uh, first I want to thank Ellen. The talk was really just magnificent, and I've read a lot of, or at least skimmed a lot of these papers and followed the news, probably like many of us. Your talk was great, um, and it's a, a chance to say hello to lots of people. Um, I have to call out a few, just my old Harvard friends that are uh, on the call. So, um, But I, I just wanted to make a remark. Um, I got scolded by Zhigong for not asking a question, so that's why I had to ask. But my remark is more a follow-up, I think, on Tahir's question, because to me, what your data helps articulate are a couple things. One is the need for officials in charge to react quickly when they need to, because it, it does look like an exponential. Um, and that's important because they can institute changes. And I don't think it's quite the same as just extending the time because we now know that there are behavioral changes as you were just saying, including wearing masks. And that has to change what the effective R0 is. The R0 that everyone talks about, of course, is what happened as you nicely illustrated at the start of the disease. But the effective one that now we get to live with is up to our community. And our community can institute some changes, whether it is just wearing a mask or, as you said, distancing. So I'd want to be optimistic that uh, we can at least learn to live maybe a bit more effectively with this than just taking the past with a large R0 and then just stretching it out and saying there's nothing we can do about it. So I'd, I don't know, to me, it's just pointing out all the things that we can try to think about as mitigation strategies, many of which you've been talking about. That doesn't um, to say I know at all how to deal with the risk that each of us face when we are out there. I think that's something that is, uh, I think makes us all nervous. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, two things to this. I think that, that it's kind of a positive. I think what I've just shown is that really people have learned and that I think you can quantify with the models, although everything else is kind of normal. Um, the R is not six, like you said, it's really, it's 1.5 or what that still means, of course, if, as long as larger than one, it still means that at some point it will go up. But it also means that it's a lot easier to control. Another thing is that we actually know that we can control it and what how long it would take. So I think that's a good thing. And then I also wanted to actually um, take up on the first thing you said, which I think is important. So we are all modeling people. And I think we have kind of a responsibility to actually go out and educate others about models, because I've, the re one reason why we did this initially is really to say, um, we, I don't want to live with the fact that people look at these models that have been projected at these press conferences, like five different models, five different curves, nothing matches reality. And I think it gives a really negative uh, connotation to modeling to our community. And I think we should actually go out and proudly say, no, this is not what real modeling does. I mean, we all aware when we do a model that there are limitations to it and we're not overselling the model. And I think that's a very, very important message that we as a community at this point actually have to somehow responsibly communicate with the public and say, look, I mean, there are limitations. We can model so this. Can I you ask can a learn from question modeling. on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're all at universities almost everyone on the call, if not everyone at the call. And we probably are at universities that have different decisions now about bringing back students, not to even think about our public school systems. And so I'm at a university that uh, until a week ago was gonna bring back half their students. And as of a week ago is now bringing back zero students. I personally think it's the right decision without a lot of data on hand, because my worry is um, not that you can't isolate the people inside, but that you have people from the 
the staff and the faculty or whatever going back and forth. And so have you looked at that to try to help think about, you know, cause we're at a set of universities, everyone's made different decisions. We do have different community structures, but, uh, and I know there've been some models about this, but so I, am, I must say I am concerned because you, you start to put a large number of people, maybe not all who are all that careful in a, in a common environment with, with people going in and out. It's a very good point. And I think universities are slightly special, at least the, the ones with residential campuses. We, we could vote right? on here. We could see all the different distributions of possibilities going on. Okay, who raised your hand? Whose university is all online? Let's see, does anybody, did anybody make the call to go on online? Oh, Stanford is now all online? No, I'm just waving because we oh, are still, in, we are in the decision making. So it's only Princeton? Harvard. <laughs> Okay, so we, we're still pushing it because we are on quarter, so we don't start until mid-September. So we're waiting for everybody to see what happens. So we still have not yet decided, um, which is a, kind of the observing approach. But I think at university is a different setup in a way. And I guess you, you know this because I guess people live on campus. That's the most risky thing. Also because you bring people from all over, right? It's not just like Newfoundland where people come from one place. Um, but it would be something to model. We actually thought about this because you know exactly where your students come from, where they are right now, and what the prevalence is in these places. So essentially you can very well predict, you have five students from there with a, with a rate of this, they have them come and it's very likely that 3.5% of people or students will have this when they come here or 15 students or so. So I think that that's something you can actually calculate by the numbers. I guess when you get on a plane, you can calculate there's three other people who buy just statistics will have the virus now. Um, so I guess it's a decision the university makes and I, I agree with you, but I also have to say, um, we can't just stay closed forever, right? Just because it's the safest. I mean, <laughs> and thinking about, I think we are all very live in a luxury environment where the people who are on the call now probably can all say, yeah, for us, this can continue. We can work from home perfectly. We see this, everybody is connected, everybody is online, but not everybody has this luxury in life. And I think we also want oh, to be in that. Thank you. No, it was really a great talk. So, and thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you, Harvard. And I, I think uh, private schools will be a little bit different and the public universities will have to correlate their decisions more with the state government politics and so forth. So. That's a complex question, I am sure. Yeah. So I would like to call upon uh, Professor John Hutchinson to ask his question. Uh, John. Uh, John, I think John is uh, is off screen now. I see. Okay, I'll move, and we'll come back to him if he comes back. Uh, uh, Prasad, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and? Ask yeah, I, um, I'm Prasad Kasi Bhatla. I am a Duke University and I'm an atmospheric chemist. And I've got interested in this because there seems there's increasing evidence that airborne transmission is an important um, aspect of, and maybe even a dominant, plays a dominant role in uh, transmission on, on aerosols, which is different from droplets. Um, and so I have a question that kind of connects to what Brian Cox asked. We have developed these simple physics-based models uh, to calculate the concentration of viral particles in and close in classrooms and things like that. And we use simple infectious disease models to calculate probabilities of infection in those settings. So, you know, given a classroom, size of the classroom, ventilation rates, we calculate probabilities of infection. And I've been wondering whether it's possible to connect those process-based models in these individual setting with the kind of network models that you're talking about. And the perfect place to kind of do that might be in universities where the network models, we know exactly who's meeting, who's meeting where. And we also based on card swipe, Wi-Fi data and stuff, we have data on how many people are gathering in what kind of space where we can, where we can calculate with our process models, these probabilities of infection. So I wonder if that's a place where our two communities can connect. That's a great, um, great point. And I think we should bilaterally um, get in touch after this, but I think just for everybody, I think my answer would be 
you can, of course, be very granular. I think it's kind of like a multi-scale model, which is something that we usually also do in our community a lot. I guess on other things that we model multi-scale, you can zoom in into information. I think that's what you're saying and really be very granular about how you feed. And I think Pradeep said what you're using in your model are only constitutive parameters in a way, right? The A and B and C and whatever. And I think what you're saying is we can derive these A's and B's and C's Definitely. really based on um, on the chemistry or on more granular information to really um, have a, a multi-scale model that informs what these parameters actually mean. So we do this for our in our normal life when we model the heart or the brain. So I really want to get in touch with you and learn more about it because I think there's a lot to learn about just, because now we're just saying this is the infectious rate or something, right? And there would be a lot of information actually what you have to explain that better and understand it better. Yeah, great Maybe point. I can email you after the talk. Uh, yeah, time. absolutely, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Prasad. Uh, Atta, uh, uh, would you like to ask your question? Please introduce yourself. Uh, sure, my name is uh, Ate Kadoma. I'm going to be a first-year graduate student in Jigang Suo's group at Harvard University. Um, so I really enjoyed your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, my question to you is, um, do you think in the future something worth investigating would be how uh, the coincidence of other diseases might affect the infectious rate or, say, the transmissibility? Because um, a big concern, at least in the United States, is towards the fall season, we also get um, flu. And so uh, maybe with flu, you might have like a weakened immune system and how you, may, you might be more susceptible to coronavirus. So, I mean, obviously we don't have data for that right now, but um, as we approach that season and maybe afterwards, do you think that that would be something worth investigating or another model that you could, or another parameter that perhaps you could add to your model? Yeah, thanks, Arthur. That's a great question. By the way, you picked a great lab. <laughs> Thank you. So um, when people model season, uh, seasonality in general, they just, it's very, this very simple model is just to put a sine wave that you distribute over the year, and then you blend in and blend out the maxima over the fall. So that's kind of an easy way to do it. But I think what you're asking is more mechanistic to really ask, is there an interaction between different diseases? And I think that's very interesting because in that sense, people probably haven't really looked at it. So this like this sine wave, you can always do, but in a way it's one of the smartest way of put in what you want to get out, but really have this two different diseases and see how they interact um, and look at the dynamics and how vulnerable people are when they have either of the two or both together. I think that's a very interesting point. And I'm sure that people would actually get into that once the fall season starts. That's a great point. Thank you, Atta. Uh, uh, Zingang, I, I think believe you, you have a question. Okay, so uh, this is a question about, I have really admire your courageous because you, I know you're so deeply involved in brains and heart, this kind of thing. Uh, now you jump into this. Uh, so you also mentioned there are 10,000 papers on website. So there are many models, five of them disagree on the screen. So um, now, uh, what, what, so, uh, so how do you really, uh, as a researcher, um, work in this kind of environment. Um, so there are also big institutions, right? Produce uh, predictions. H how do you do this? I don't know the sociology of this community at all. It must be fascinating. Yeah, so I, I mean, we do it actually out of sheer interest, I must say, right? That, like yeah. I said, we're not funded yeah. on this and we do it out of curiosity and we want to understand it. And that's really what's driving it. And that's why also we, we don't owe anybody a fast response. So I think that helps. Um, I must say, I'm always jealous of the people at Harvard. And many of you have told me <laughs> you should be that Harvard you, people do this free science and at Stanford, nobody does this. And I think it's actually, there's a lot of pressure actually to, to deliver things, right? And I think here we really have taken ourselves the liberty to do this. And um, that's really the freedom of things. And I, I think you're right. So if you want to go controversial, you'd have to talk to people and say, look, is my model better than yours? And 
eventually what's wrong in your model. And, and I think that's probably what needs to happen. Um, but also, I mean, as modeling people, we know that there's no wrong or right model in a way, right? So I guess there's room for a lot of people to do this and answer different questions. And obviously when I talk to this community, people understand what we're doing because we're doing it in the same language. I'm sure if you talk to an epidemiology community, not everybody will understand it and they will have the models that they trust. For us, what was actually eye-opening is that these people from Newfoundland and they were epidemiologists, they came up to us and they have been using this. Um, and I think it's just interesting that people come and actually say, okay, how can you help us? And I think by doing this, I think we grow more of a confidence. Um, but you're right. I mean, eventually there's a lot of people and a lot of good people. I'm not saying with like there's massive groups that do this very, very well. Deep, can I ask a question? Jimmy, yeah, please go ahead. First. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, it's a great talk. I have a very sort of a granular but also strange question. Uh, when I look at the uh, cases, number of new cases, uh, especially in the US, there's a perfect seven day period. So every seven day you hit the, you, you would hit the peak. So uh, I ask myself why this is so. Obviously there's a weekend or there's something like that. So every seven days uh, uh, during the weekend, people, uh, hospitals are closed. People don't want to go there. And then I look at the, uh, the new death data. Every seven day, you hit the peak. If you say that people cannot go to the hospital because during the weekend, the hospitals are closed, you cannot control the death of that. Is it something real? Do you see an oscillatory behavior in your model? But your prediction seems to be quite smooth. Certainly, the new cases and the death data, especially in the US, is very periodic. So that's a great question. And that's something I didn't talk about. So there's a lot of tricks, or I wouldn't say tricks, but things to make it work. Um, and that actually, in a way, what Kevin and Matthias done, have done, they're both here. Um, I don't know if Kevin wants to say something, but uh, what they use is a seven day window to average because of exactly what you said. So there's this reporting um, peaks on Tuesday. You don't have high numbers on Saturday, Sunday. Usually they come up on Tuesday. And so what you want to do is you kind of use the, the weekly averaged window that moves with the disease. Um, now it's not so much a problem because when you're in a smooth phase, uh, you can average over these seven days things. If you're in a, a very changing thing, like a, an exponential growth or a lockdown, for instance, and you have a lockdown, it's very hard to average, right? So I think that it's fair to do this in a, in a smooth phase that we're in now to just use this moving window. In the beginning of the disease, it was very hard to do because there was very little to average over. Um, but I think the more data we have, the more we learn. And you can also see every time something, some politics changes, there's a discontinuity in the data. And you don't want to lose that because that's a natural discontinuity, right? So if you average over, over a policy change, you really want to see the jump, right? So that's it's a little tricky, but the seven day averaging, I think people do in the common. Yeah, but, but do you really feel that even the report of death data is affected by that? Maybe Alain can say something to that. Yeah, I can comment a little bit on that. The, the death data that you have is when the uh, reporting comes to whatever institute give the data nationally or internationally. So the data is not the number of deaths of dead people on that day, it's the number of, cert of death certificate that they receive on that day, essentially. So that was, in the weekend, people don't work, they don't send the death certificate, and you see it is oscillation. That's the main yep, thing. It's all the, the weekend. It's all the weekend. Good, good point, Alan. Uh, but the certificate shows when this per person died. Yeah, but the data that we have is never about the, the death on the certificate. Is the death is the the day of the of the death, is the day where the certificate is reported to the agency. So there is always it can be actually more. It can be two weeks delay depending on where you are in the country. So that it's it quite subtle to see the effect and these these kind of subtle effect can play a role in the way you understand the data also. 
So it's not physical, in other words. Yeah, no. It's Otherwise, you would have to go to every death certificate and extract the date. Then you would have the real information, but that's not available. Yeah. Uh, Tahir, I think you had your hand up. Uh, you still have the question, or? Yeah, uh, I do. So, uh, so much of a question. Um, I think um, the, the previous discussion was it about the campuses, and I think many people like we are going to have a hybrid model starting next week and um, we'll have labs, you know, close by. And um, so what we have done, like Pradeep, you mentioned the public schools have different policies. So we are testing 10,000 every day uh, and then twice a week testing and hope that that would prevent the, the fire uh, spreading among all the students. But, uh, I think the campuses have not much choice left uh, other than opening because the science institute uh, instructions would not go too far without any labs, uh, without hands-on training. Uh, so that was my comment. Uh, sorry, that's why I took my hands off also. Yeah, no, no it's an interesting comment, Tahir, and I think it will probably take us too far away from uh, Ellen's model <laughs> to discuss this issue. It actually, it's actually 90% of my daily work right now is to yeah. open uh, teaching labs and think about that because it's actually really, really good point. How yeah. much do we need to be physically there, right? Yeah, yeah. The other thing, I, uh, maybe it's maybe not, I just want to raise the point and then maybe not to discuss is that I think what I noticed uh, in the last few months, and I, I myself have spent almost the last three months working on just to think about what is the effect of mask, uh, looking into you know, different type of clots and what prevents the droplets to spread out. And what I realized is uh, that individual labs like Ellen's lab um, and my lab and many others sort of came out out of sheer curiosity and spent a heavy amount of time uh, I'm, I'm some of my other colleagues who did something with COVID. It's an enormous dedication, enormous sacrifice, quote unquote sacrifice, because they were not funded. Uh, and the students spending the time were not under a given project because it's out of the typical project they were funded for. And then I begin to wonder, and it is no offense to anybody, that we have a huge uh, national lab infrastructure and in a big uh, government infrastructures, laboratories, uh, I see there's a disconnect. I think in terms of understanding COVID, understanding some of the basic questions, these little labs with three, four, five people have played a significant role without any funding at all. Uh, whether it's through the models, whether it is looking at, you know, questions of how it spreads, uh, whether, you know, using the laser beams to see, you know, what happens to the droplets, they're all coming out from small labs. And it left me with a sense of wonder that you know, if we all didn't do anything, if none of the labs, small lab didn't do anything, would be, where would we be? It, it just, just a comment and I don't want to politicize this. It, it just left me with the question um, that what is our science infrastructure is in the country now? But let's get back to models and technical stuff. But I mean, to, to the credit, I think there are large groups who do this and who have actually contributed much to our understanding. So it wouldn't be fair to claim that we are the first people who have really done this and who have done it most successfully. There are huge communities. And I think people are very successful, at least in this field, uh, to do this. They just communicated probably differently. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a still value to what people do and also to the continuation of doing this. I mean, we do this explosively, right? Because we're interested in it. But mm -hmm. I mean, we can only do this because there's a, a huge amount of basic science that we can build on, right? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not saying that the big labs didn't do anything. I, I, I'm no. trying to say is that a lot of credit goes to small labs who came out out of curiosity, out of just understanding things without a lot of prior experience in the field. And that that's under underestimated. That is a very interesting point, and of course, Ellen mentioned this as well. The uh, I think I read an article uh, many years ago which said that some of the most impactful scientific discoveries that were made in the history of science were essentially unfunded, at least uh, what we conventionally call funding. They were sort of curiosity driven and somebody's act of passion, 
mm-hmm. and that's so that's a but it's an interesting philosophical question but we I, I think we will try to get back to Alan's work uh, uh, and we need to have a happy hour about some of these issues about university opening as well as funding <laughs> uh, but I have somebody who's had his raise uh, Lihua uh, you want to introduce yourself and ask your question Hey, Alan and everybody. Uh, this is Li Hua Jing from UCRA. Yeah, I have two questions. So uh, first question is, I noticed there's a feature about the data that the death rate actually drops significantly, like recently, not only in the US, but also globally. Yeah, I wonder whether this is kind of an input or auto output of the model. And why that? So wh- why is a uh, significant drop of death rate. Is that because of mutation or some other reason? I suppose I can't answer that because um, I really don't know exactly um, the epidemiology of it. I think we've all seen that there was a high hit on very vulnerable people initially. Um, and now I guess it's just the very nature that the disease is in locations where people are less vulnerable. It's also true in the sense that we're testing a lot of asymptomatic people they probably don't even show symptoms and then also really don't die of the disease. The death rate is something that people always look at the ground truth, right? A lot of people say, well, the reporting of the people, we don't know. There's a lot of asymptomatic people, we don't know. But the only thing we know is really the death rate. So a lot of people look at this as like, okay, we need to calibrate all the modeling with respect to the death rate, because that's kind of a ground truth. That's something we know. And even that is something we don't really know because some countries report death as death because of the disease, some reported as death with the disease. So that's even even there where we think, okay, that's something that we all read out. Um, There's huge variations. And if you look at the variations between the different countries, it's in a way hard to believe that some countries have a, a rate of three and others 15, 16, 17. On average, if you look at the world, I think the death rate of the currently um, in relation to the uh, infected population is really high, it's about 10%, 12, 15. Um, I don't know how reasonable that is. I don't know how that would change over time um, because this is a dynamic, um, still dynamic, right? So if you have something that's increasing and the death rate relay is shifted by a few weeks, I mean, that's always very hard to say, but I agree. I mean, we just really don't know enough about it. I think in a couple of years, we will look back and probably understand better, but it would be kind of hard to say. Um, you can only look at the data and say exactly what you're saying. It's weird that there's these peaks or some countries have these huge outliers on death rate, which you cannot explain by healthcare system alone. But, but Lihua, uh, I believe there are some uh, people who claim that over time, we gain yeah. a lot more experiences treating these patients. So uh, because of that, some patients would survive, uh, you know, uh, because of these uh, essentially new experiences. For example, that they claim that if you pl- flip the patient face down, that would help the circulation of uh, oxygen in the lung. That would very often uh, save the patient's life. So some of these tricks, they're not necessarily scientific, but once you gain that experience, you actually reduce the death rate. Okay, my second question yet uh, is to follow up uh, on Zhigang's question. Yeah, you uh, jump into this field so quickly and also like previously you work on heart, mechanics of heart and brain. How do you migrate into a field so quickly? And I also noticed a feature previously uh, when you work on brain, when you started, you wrote very comprehensive review papers. Right? Yeah, I just wonder like how you migrate into a field quickly. I, I think I have to give credit really at this point. I don't know if you can see Kevin is here and he has done a lot of work. <laughs> so I've been just very blessed with, uh, with working with really great people. So, um, and Matthias is a postdoc also in our lab. Um, and we have really just dropped everything because we were interested. I think I've just been very blessed <laughs> in a lot of, I mean, you've been to our lab meeting, you know, that. <laughs> It's not me, it's like really the people around uh, in the group and the, the dynamics of the group that make that happen. So I think it's just luck and, and being with, uh, surrounded by very smart people, I must say. Oh, 
I was on mute. Thank you, Liva. Um, I think I believe Tang has a question. Tang, yeah, go ahead. Alan, you're you're going to be tired by the time this whole thing is finished. We have lots of interest. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, this is Tang Li from University of Maryland. Thank you, Alan, for this fantastic and uh, timely uh, webinar. Um, for those of you who uh, actually joined uh, the live webinar after 10 o'clock today, I would uh, uh, like you to, uh, we had a very interesting uh, uh, pre-seminar informal uh, interview uh, done by Pradeep and Alan. Uh, it's actually, uh, to me, it's one of the best pre-seminar interviews so far in EML webinar. And the video will be available in the EML webinar uh, YouTube channel later today. And uh, for those people in China, I also posted in the EML webinar uh, uh, Weibo account. You will be able to view it uh, earlier tomorrow morning uh, local time. Uh, the reason I'm, uh, I want to mention this is uh, in the uh, 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 interview before the uh, seminar, uh, Alan, you mentioned that uh, interesting fact that uh, you actually uh, published or at least submitted seven papers when, with one of the uh, collaborators uh, uh, after you started to work on this COVID-19 modeling. Uh, this is actually an interesting observation. Of course, uh, many of us uh, have been doing this uh, remote collaborations uh, and, and you mentioned that you, you, you didn't even uh, uh, meet with the collaborator yet so far. Uh, I think that's a, a very uh, nice example that uh, optimize uh, what this new situation has changed the research landscape. Uh, I want to echo uh, what uh, Howard and also Tahir uh, just asked previously. Uh, if you look at the panel today, we have a very diverse panel, uh, not only geographically. We have uh, researchers from coast to coast and continent to continent but also with uh, researchers at different uh, positions and different stages. We have uh, you know, younger researchers, more senior researchers. And also if I come here, I see multiple department head, dean of the graduate school, director of a large centers. So now just like many uh, aspects of our life that uh, probably we won't be able to go back to the normal. We probably need to redefine what is the new normal of our life, uh, just like this for the research landscape, uh, we probably will have to define, redefine the new norms. Um, so my question is actually not only for Alan, but also for the, our panelists uh, here today. So what do you think the, uh, the new norm of the research, scientific research, uh, I wouldn't say the coast, uh, after, uh, post COVID, because it's still ongoing. Uh, what kind of changes uh, you are experiencing and what do you think the upcoming changes there? Probably permanent, and that's my question. Thank you. I think this is not a question for me. I think everybody can Yeah, it's for this. everyone. I, I but I, before, before, we, before we open this, I think I would like to thank you and Jigang for actually having the vision and organizing all of this and putting this together. Also for Pradeep for the interesting questions and preparing so well. So this, I think, is a really, really cool format where people can join and they can watch it. And I was saying earlier that I watched many of um, the, the seminars that are online that Tang just mentioned. And I think it's really, really nice to bring people together and build community across different groups that otherwise don't interact. And I can only think, okay, if I had given the seminar live somewhere, there would have been people in the audience. They would probably not have stayed an extra hour even if you had given them cookies and coffee. So this is actually really quite amazing. So thank you for putting this together and having such a vision, Shigang and Tang. Thank you. Now I want, I turn to the question is a general but important. Let's make it concrete. Here is a Kevin in the audience. Let's ask him, is this an enjoyable collaboration with Alan? Is Alan a good advisor? Very concrete. Be careful, be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> but in general, how, how do you uh, get started? Very concrete on doing that, right? Both of you probably have no real experience working on this kind of model before, right? Is that right? How do you get started? That's right. Um, I, 
actually Alan said everything already. It's purely out of curiosity or out of that our community somehow get pushed more in the media by that modeling became relevant for the whole world out of the sun. And that we thought we can also probably um, at, at first just understand what is going on and then after we first understand it um, how we can probably set certain um, aspects which is not so yeah um, so be considered by the um, actual community who has worked on that and how we uh, we started working on that was actually very classically like Alan set up a weekly uh, lab meeting on zoom and afterwards we started chatting about modeling COVID-19 and yes it was a really um, exciting time I learned a lot um, during to that and yeah I think it was pretty successful for us it's evident by the seven papers that we had so far <laughs> like Alan showed so. <laughs> So let me also ask this uh, question uh, to Elaine. You're an applied mathematician, and also uh, you're involved. Uh, you probably have a even longer perspective on this kind of model, you know, a pandemic model. So you, you have a, so for example, uh, multiple groups, uh, or not multiple, yeah. many groups work on this probably several groups are actually adopting same similar model. There might be other approaches. Do, do you have a... Yeah, so it, the, yeah. the epidemiological model of this type as SIR is really like bread and butter for a lot of applied mathematics. There is a whole branch. And out of that branch of applied mathematics, you have specialized group that started existing in certain universities who fully look at uh, the propagation of disease and have very good model for each one and one and all the other ones. And these are the big groups that the government taps uh, and, 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 and study. What I think what, what Alan, Alan show with our interest is that clearly the big groups, they have big models because you know they have to include everything in the, in the mix right, because they've been studying for a long time and so it's all about the contact matrix or people of different age group interact, the stochastic effect, so having a continuous and stochastic system, uh, you know, all uh, agent-based model, they all do that. Very complicated and very sophisticated in terms of validation. But what, uh, what Evan shows is that you can uh, approach differently and look at conceptual problems. So big ideas, simple questions, and try to tease them out, uh, which is not something you can easily get out of these uh, uh, big models. Um, in terms of modeling, I think there is some kind of baseline, the kind of model that Ellen used, and that there are multiple, multiple branches off of that. You know, you go to discrete system when you, you get enough granularity, you go to stochastic effect and so on. And so that all these groups take care of that. But I think what's, what's, uh, what's missing, and to answer the question of Taha, is that uh, these big groups probably uh, are not that interested in conceptual problem. They're more interested in uh, doing actual forecasting. You know, they have, they have a mission. It says, are we going to do the best possible forecast and look at all possible uh, intervention and then rank them. And these makes very large papers, uh, which are, uh, are very important for policy, but in terms of academia to understand uh, more subtle effects like linking particularly mobility to uh, disease dynamics, you have to look at simpler models like Ellen use. And I think that there is something that our community of theoretical and applied mathematics can still bring to the table thanks to these, these different approaches. Thank you. Let me, let me ask a, a more concrete question or uh, comment here. So uh, as uh, Ali mentioned, that this, uh, uh, you found uh, very timely and uh, has been very productive in, the, in this uh, COVID-19 modeling and uh, uh, prediction. I think this is uh, also somewhat reflected uh, with the impact of the uh, uh, pandemic to the research. For example, uh, 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 most of the, or many of the institutions have, has shut down the research lab in the past uh, several months, at least uh, in the earlier uh, this year. Uh, in my own group, uh, uh, 
the experimental side of uh, uh, my research definitely uh, has been influenced or impact negatively by this shutdown. Uh, for example, some even the paper rebuttal, a single experiment data, you need to wait for two months to get, get back to the lab to, to get that data. Even for now, we only have 25% of uh, uh, availability of the lab opening. But on the other hand, the modeling side of my research, there is no interruption, interruption at all. And actually, I given that you, know, you have extra time without the commute, and uh, we actually be more productive on the modeling side of this. I think I'm not alone on this. So there is a saying that um, uh, everyone trusts experiment, but the experimentalists themselves, and nobody trusts modeling, but the modelers themselves. So will this say be changed uh, or at least a, a bit uh, in the, in the future research? For example, will people spend more time or more effort to focus on uh, modeling if you don't have enough uh, uh, capability or uh, availability to access experimental research? I think it's a generally good question. I mean, I see this only um, in a way as a department chair because we bring people back on campus and the modeling people are not supposed to go back until January. So there's always this discussion. And then the experimentalists say, I mean, after a month having their labs closed, they would just say, oh yeah, yeah, we've done the modeling. We're done with the modeling now, what do we do? They say, what, what do you mean you're done with the modeling after four weeks? So that's kind of the perception, right? And I think this is, this is an interesting point. And I think in a way we are lucky that we can do what we can do and we have to actually really be blessed. And many of the things we can do translate so well into this environment. And that's definitely not the case for everybody. It's an opportunity obviously also, but I agree. I mean, it's challenging for people who really need lab access. Yeah, I think uh, Tang, you raised the interesting points about how the landscape will change uh, in the future. I, I have, maybe I'm very old fashioned, but I believe that uh, once this is over, uh, there will be some changes, obviously. I think the, 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 there'll be an acceleration towards online thinking, uh, virtual stuff and everything. Definitely that was gonna happen anyway, but now it will just be accelerated. But some of the basics will really not change in my opinion. The moment that people are able to, they will realize that meeting in a conference, having a beer, is how you build the relationships. We can do this because we already have some relationship pre-existing, which was forged by the conferences, where we met in person, where we had, we joked around and uh, we had dinner together. So I think once this whole thing is over, people will be <laughs> rushing to buy the plane tickets to get to the next conference. Uh, that you may even see people who have never been into a conference for a long time. So. I, I think things will change. Uh, rather, the changes will be accelerated. Some changes will be accelerated, which are going to happen anyway. But we are still humans, so you know we still learn the same way. I, I think when when the uh, the video when the video tapes came up, people said the books will be obsolete, and then you know when the internet came up, people said you know there nobody will go to campus. But in the end of the day, we still need human interaction, right? So real human interaction, not virtual. So uh, I. That's my feeling. I think that uh, things will change, but many things that pertain to human behavior will remain very much the same. So one thing you probably noticed the last month, uh, the nature cover feature of this uh, 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 robust chemist, uh, which can do work without interruption for a month or so, uh, high efficiency and uh, can mm -hmm. uh, select the down from 100 million recipes down to 1,000 recipe of catalyst uh, discovery. Uh, that could be another new norm, uh, for example, this AI or machine learning driven research in the future. Even the experiment can be done by robot and then we as <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, researchers, we can maybe social more, <laughs> uh, but get more things done. That's another observation. It's happening, actually, uh, amazingly. And it's situation. Yeah, I have one more question for uh, both Alan and uh, Alain. Uh, 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 anyway, so the question is about big data. So uh, 
in doing this model, you because know, uh, you 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 have to use a lot of data. Uh, perhaps uh, is collected by government. Do you have a uh, uh, a lot of access compared to big groups, or you just you can only have a very sub limited subset of data? What's the situation? Well, actually, in this case, it's very, very special because a lot of things are well documented. And we look at these yeah. data, actually, I think they're reported in the news, they are on the website. And actually, a lot of people have come to share. So there's a lot uh -huh. of like GitHub where people really use and link the data. You can download um, Excel spreadsheets. And actually, students and postdocs in our group have become smart to really download things by the day. Yeah. I'm and that's actually doable. So which is actually poses an opportunity, right? Because you can live download things and update things. And this really is the case. There are some, just very few things where we had to rely on our travel data. For instance, when we work with the government, they gave us some access to some travel data that are not usually available. But a lot of this is available. Mm -hmm. um, what some people ask is not available. And I think that's why there's so little modeling on it. So the granularity of age groups, for instance, there's no such knowledge that is published. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the data that are available are not always the way we would like them, right? Because we have to polish, like we said, there's four seven day windows and then somehow it's a delay in reporting and you kind of have to post process. But it's generally one of the very few situations where a lot of data is available and actually also very well documented. So that's actually quite, quite unique. So Pradeep, it's your call. Yes, I, I, I'm actually, uh, I'm sure we could continue for a while longer, but I am uh, I think Ellen has been probably, she's in California <laughs> time, I'm sure that she's been up for a long time uh, and uh, 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 speaking uh, nonstop. Uh, I think uh, in, uh, in the interest of that, uh, we probably should uh, bring it to a closure. It was a really wonderful, Ellen. Uh, it was a great talk, as everybody has said, and uh, the discussion was also very enjoyable. Uh, we, we probably will need more follow-up discussions on this topic uh, offline uh, over beer or other suitable non-alcoholic beverages as the case may be and to discuss what is going to happen with the university and the pandemic and the politics. I, yeah, uh, I was just going to say, I mean, anybody would be happy to answer emails or stay in touch. I was just going to say we do, can do email, but Pradeep, if you want to send me a beer, I'm happy to. <laughs> German beer, right? Yeah, sure. The, the, I think that's what, that's in fact, fine, that's exactly yeah. what I'm drinking these days. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, all the participants uh, who, who were here and the panelists. This was uh, wonderful. And uh, Zigang, Tang, and other editors, uh, Jimmy, uh, this, this idea is brilliant, brilliant idea. Yeah, this is really, really amazing. Thank you so much for making this happen. Very, very unique. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Wow. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. This is really, really amazing. It's a lot of fun to do. And a lot of people. Yeah. Very All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Okay.